Okay, folks. Let's start getting this uh, getting this little chat on the road here. So, what we're going to talk about today is basically how to not be boring. But I'm really quantifying this as a as a way of looking at story length, um, rather than a way of like here's how you execute not being boring. Um, I'm going to tweet this out right now because there's two different levels there. There's executing your story well enough, like your prose, your dialogue, so that the reader isn't bored. And then there's what I really want to talk about today, which is the length of your story, the length of your book. A lot of times people ask me, how long should a book be? And they want some sort of word count number, like, you know, it needs to be 100,000 words long or something like that. And I often give the wrong answer. And so the answer I tend to give is that, you know, oh, you know, if you're going to traditionally publish, um, you know, a book should be you know, they're looking for first books to be 100,000 words. And while that is completely true, and there's, you know, nothing dishonest about that about that particular um, statement, it's not really what people need to hear as far as how long does a story need to be. Because then they start trying to stretch or fill their story out to some length that I set. Like, I want to write a novella, but my story is at like 35,000 words. I'm like, just write it to whatever length the story needs to be. What I'm gonna talk about today is how long or short a story can be in terms of how you pace things, things that you include in the story, and really uh, how to cut your story out from being something that is really over large and possibly boring to a reader, uh, down to something which is really interesting and really sticks to the story. One of the things you'll notice is that when, um, when say a book is translated into a movie when you have an adaptation you will have a 500 page book go to a two-hour movie and you have an 800 page book go to a two-hour movie a thousand page book go to a two-hour movie a 400 page book go to, everything goes down to a two-hour movie because you have this really set format or 90 minutes really um we've we have different trends with cinema where longer movies are, are acceptable for a while and they have been for a while a little bit over the two hours mark of a, but during the early 2000s it was everything had to be 90 minutes and in fact it wasn't even 90 minutes it was 88 to get that extra showing in every day to make the extra money um so how do they do that how do screenwriters do that well they take a look at the story and they literally just cut out everything that is superfluous to the main point of the story and so a really good adaptation uh, a, a good screenwriter will be able to adapt a rather long book into a two-hour format simply because he's able to throw out a lot of the stuff that the author has decided is important now what you want to do as an author is make sure that you're not including a whole lot of stuff that isn't that important i'm not saying you have to cut everything down to the bare bare bones uh, i prefer to do that when i write you notice i've been putting out a lot of song a lot of a lot of books like moon song uh, or City of Silver that are about 35,000 words. Um, all the Needle Ash books are about are about that length, uh, between 35 and 40,000 words, um, which is a, some people would consider that a novella. It's longer than Old Man in the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. So that was a book you had to read in high school, I assume. Um, so, you know, depending on how you think about it, that's a novella or a novel. But the whole point is to cut this story down to what really matters for a reader so that they're never bored. One of the things that makes a, a reader close the book is that they get bored and they get bored because the story is not progressing fast enough. And this is the thing people misunderstand about pacing is they think pacing is something about the way you're executing your prose. And it's really about how fast the story events are coming. And if the story events happen too fast, it can actually be a little bit of a problem. But usually authors are putting in more stuff than they need to. They're, they're imagining a scene and so they write everything that they imagine without thinking about how those elements are going to go into the final story. That's why some authors, when they get to a completed manuscript, they've written 150,000 words and then they're, they cut it down to 100,000 words. They cut 50 or about 30% of their story is out the window. How can they do that? How could you stand to cut that much out of your story? And the reason is when you're drafting, they just have an approach to drafting where they write in everything they want in the story. And then for the editing phase, they really take a hard look at what needs to be there and they cut it up with a razor and really, um, really cut it down. Stephen King, um, who is kind of notorious for writing long books, tends to cut a lot of stuff. Uh, and so the draft, it, 
is usually longer uh, than what he has to finally turn in. And in some cases, it's against a little bit against his will. So when he had to uh, publish The Stand, which is a very long book in its original version, he had to cut 100,000 words out of the manuscript. And that's because the original one was over 500,000 words. So it was as long as Lord of the Rings in like one book. And the publisher said it's too expensive to make a book that thick. Because once you get to a certain thickness, the binding costs go up. You have to use special binding and stuff to make a book that thick. So I don't know why they didn't cut it, you know, publish it as three books. That probably would have been better. But back then they were into publishing things as one book for whatever reason. So um, they had to cut. He chose to do the cuts. They're like, either we're going to cut it or you get to cut it. He's like, I'll cut it. So he cut 110,000 words, I think, out of it. And so if you buy it. The, I don't have it sitting around, but if you buy the modern version of the stand, it'll have those extra hundred and some odd thousand words in it. And um, you have to ask a question. If you were able to tell the story minus those hundred thousand words, what extra things are you getting with those hundred thousand words? And I haven't done an analysis of this because that book is so long. I don't know if I would want to like find the original version and compare them and, and just talk about that. But um, it's a it's a lesson that's worth noting is if you can tell it with less words, you probably should. I will give some story length, um, some some numbers for you guys to help you think about how long a story really needs to be or how long a typical story needs to be depending on the style. Before going any further, let me plug uh, my newest book, which is the December book. And... Uh, here is what it looks like. Let me show you the cover. Um, of course, this cover is designed by me. It's called Eyes in the Walls. This is a straight horror story. A um, little bit of a synopsis of this. This is a story where uh, it has a couple of themes that are familiar. If you if you read Voices of the Void, which came out earlier this year, I think in July. I don't know where I have a copy of it. My 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 desk is a mess. I've been so busy. Um, with everything, um, so if you watch, you know, if you if you read Voices of the Void, no, nope, that's Crown of Sight. You should read Crown of Sight. That's a good one too. Another one. This one was like, how razor thin can I get it? And a little bit behind this one was, I basically had a story in mind, and I just took the fifth act and just made that the book, and people were like, that's a great story. So I just left all the I left all the building tension out and just had the last battle, and it, it worked out great. Um, Voices of the Void. So. Another thin one. Thin enough, I can't even print the title on the spine. This one was 24,000 words. If you liked some of the themes in this, including Unreliable Narrator, Descent into Madness, Eyes in the Walls definitely has that. Okay, and uh, so this boy, he sees a monster in the morgue. Now, his his mom basically owns a funeral home, and uh, a little bit more of the story, she's a she does private autopsies, meaning she's a doctor, what's called a forensic pathologist uh, here in the United States. And this is a thing that you can actually do in the United States is you can do private autopsies at uh, certain facilities. This would be if you were in a civil suit and you needed an autopsy to determine the cause of death outside of, say, a criminal um, complaint. Like if, you know, um, it, obviously if somebody was murdered, you'd probably have the the forensic pathologist for the city, what's called who's called the medical examiner, do it. But anyway, so she has a morgue in this funeral home. Not all funeral homes actually have morgues because embalming and things may be done at a different site and then the body's presented. Anyway, I don't need to talk too much about that. He sees this monster in the morgue and no one believes him. Everybody writes it off as not true. And in fact, um, a couple of his friends kind of egg him on, his cousin and some of their friends, and they go to see this monster because they don't really believe him and the monster's real to them. And... Uh, Basically, this boy gets put on psychiatric medication. He gets diagnosed with schizophrenia because the psychiatrist considers these to be paranoid delusions. And indeed, a reasonable person would think this kind of extreme reaction and belief in monsters is the result of uh, deluded thought and hallucinations, which are, are things with schizophrenia. So he gets diagnosed with early onset schizophrenia. He gets put on Thorazine, which is um, uh, an antipsychotic. And I think I had another one in there. And uh, from there, the problems with the monster only continue he the monster starts to try to come into his bedroom at night as at least what he believes and so is he crazy is he not crazy is he actually suffering delusions of this monster or is this monster a real thing but we do know that the kids believe him and so if you were a uh, part of generation y 
you may end up liking this story because there's a feeling to it. There's a feeling to it that is kind of unique to me for Generation Y, which is this feeling of being alone, the feeling of not being totally parented, being kind of isolated and uh, really bound up with your peers. Um, so that is something that I think a lot of you will like. Now, as far as story efficiency, this story is a little bit over 30,000 words. So it matches the story length that I've been doing uh, the last year or two and experimenting uh, a lot with. So um, it'll be about the length of, of these fantasy novels. Um, and I achieved that efficiency. I have a full ABC story. I achieved that efficiency mostly through style. So the first thing I did is I wrote it in a first-person perspective, which I don't normally write in per first-person perspective, and I don't normally like to read in first-person pers perspective. But I wrote this one in first-person perspective because I knew I could tell the story in a really efficient manner. And so I stripped down the details of the story all the way down to the first person because the first person is always going to focus on the details that matter and exclude all other details. Uh, if you're telling a story, you're not going to describe in detail if you're remembering something like some some object on a desk, you're only going to describe those things you remember which are relevant to the story. So it automatically makes it more efficient. And I even tried to make that even more efficient. So it's almost like 4chan green text levels of efficiency. Uh, and so I did that for the entire book. And the other thing that I did to increase efficiency is there's lots of scene breaks. So that's something that um, I'll give you a couple tips for how to really cut your story up and cut all the fluff out. One of the things you can do is do um, do a lot of scene breaks. So that's this one. It comes out December 13th. I was going to put it out December 6th. So it'll be December's book. I'm going to try to put out one book a month. I'll probably fail at that because it's really hard to do that. But this one will come out December 13th. Give me an extra... Um, extra week to promote it. So hopefully you will think about pre-ordering it for 99 cents. Uh, after the pre-order sale, it's usually going to go up to um, $2.99. Uh, the reason I don't love first-person perspective is because we know the narrator survives. So in a really tense kind of story, we have an idea that the narrator survives on some level. But because this one involves madness and this theme of um, an unreliable narrator and madness, to me, it, it's something that first-person perspective works very well because we're, we're not sure, we're always filtering through the lens of the narrator. And even though the narrator survives, we don't know if he's actually insane or not. Uh, and so there's always a, there's still like a tense question in there. Uh, that that I think works. So that's how I achieved it. Is is I, I wrote in a first person perspective, very stripped down, and I also wrote um, a lot of scene breaks. So please check that out. It's called Eyes in the Wall. It comes out December thirteenth. Um, now let's talk about a couple of strategies for determining the length of your story. So the first thing is. You have to think about what you want to include in your story and what you don't want to include in your story. Remember that there's that pyramid I talk about all the time, setting characters plot. And all of those things are what makes up the story. And each of those, depending on how much you want to talk about it in the story, is going to take up space. If you are writing in the fantasy or science fiction genres in particular, the setting that base from which you know the, the characters are born in the setting, they act in the way the setting determines, that can take up a lot of space. Or it can take up very little space. It all depends on how you approach it. If you want to be efficient, you will use direct exposition, not indirect exposition. So that's the first tip. And this is one that really, really goes towards science fiction and fantasy writers, which I know lots of you are. Um, Direct exposition versus indirect exposition. Direct exposition is saying, like, in a hole there lived a hobbit. His name was Bilbo Baggins, right? Indirect exposition would be you start with dialogue and Bilbo's talking to Gandalf and you only learn who they are by watching their interactions. It's indirect. Indirect can be very efficient, but when it comes to exposing setting, nothing beats direct exposition. This is why Tolkien used it, because there's a lot of complexity to his world. But uh, other writers have used it many, many different times. Um, and although it may feel awkward to slip in and out of direct and indirect exposition, R.A. Salvatore, in particular, if you like fantasy writers, he does it a lot and he does it really well. So some of his books, he just he just tells you how things are, and he doesn't uh, doesn't rely on you to kind of figure it out by watching 
by doing the showing part, he tells. And so telling is way more efficient and it also eliminates confusion on the parts of the reader. So if the reader knows what's going on, he's also less likely to get bored and close the book. If you're going completely indirect exposition, this is a problem with Steven Erickson. I love Steven Erickson's books. I love the Malazan books for what they are. Um, but lots of readers I talk to, they're like, I just can't get through them. I have no idea what's going on. Uh, nothing makes sense. Why doesn't he just stop and explain what's going on? That's an example of indirect exposition taken to the extreme with a very, very complex world with a lot of history. And so if you feel confused as a reader, you may close the book. So it's one of those things. The whole point is to avoid a reader closing the book. People ask me, hey, how do you get reviews on your books? And the first and best way to get reviews on your books is to write a really good book and also to write a, book, a good enough book that people finish the book. If people are not finishing your book, they're not going to ever review it. And they won't go on to book number two if you're writing a series. So you really got to you really got to put in a book, uh, put a lot of effort into having somebody be interested in an, uh, interested enough in a book to get it all the way through. This is why I kind of like the pulp format of the shorter books, which kind of herald back to days of yore, uh, because you can really get through them quickly. So that is the first one: is is use direct versus indirect exposition, meaning tell instead of show. Um, the second one is, and I mentioned this before, is use scene breaks. Scene breaks are extremely effective at cutting out garbage you don't need to talk about. And they are also going to be very effective for you to use indirect exposition efficiently. So if you imagine you're watching a movie, a movie doesn't break up the scenes to narrate anything to you. It shows you everything because it's a visual medium. It cannot tell you, but it can. Like the intro to Lord of the Rings, the movies, is telling you. It's like, you know, nine rings were made from, you know, whatever whatever Galadriel's, you know, voiceover was. So Lord of the Rings, they're telling you what's up. In uh, most movies, you're just watching it. And of course, in Lord of the Rings, you're really watching a lot of indirect exposition. You're just watching things happen. So a scene break for a screenwriter is really important is knowing exactly how long that scene needs to be in order to make it efficiently. So you can do this as a prose writer is you write the dialogue and the action for that scene. You imagine like it's a movie. Then you cut the scene. Don't write extra prose trying to link one scene to the next so there's no scene breaks. You'll notice really good writers use scene breaks frequently. A lot of them do. Michael Crichton used this to excellent effect, which is why his books tend to translate to movies really well, is because of those um, those scene breaks that he uses. And it's actually, like if you read a book like Jurassic Park, even though Jurassic Park's a fairly long book, it's very efficient. There's a ton of story and a ton of info in it. And, um, and it's really done well with the, the scene breaks. So um, scene breaks are a big one because if you if you get to the end of a scene, you've, you've done all the goals of your scene. Okay, yeah, I've had my characters talk about what they need to talk about. I've, had, I've shown this character doing this. I've had this plot thing happen. Put a little asterisk or whatever you want, whatever symbol you like to put for a scene break. Um, and then some people like a, like a, you know, a, a pound symbol or a hashtag symbol and go on to the next scene. And you'll find that you'll, you'll save a lot of space on prose. Dialogue is something that you probably want to cut last. And, but you know, you can cut a lot of prose is, is my point. Um, the other thing is you have to figure out, so this is tip number three, you have to figure out where your emphasis is going to be and what you're willing to give up in order to achieve that emphasis. If you are reading stories that are very character heavy, you will find that characters take up the most space because they have dialogue. So long conversations between characters can take up pages and pages of your book. And so if that's going to be your emphasis, if it's going to be heavy emphasis on characters, then something's got to give. And that's probably going to be plot, meaning your plot needs to be a little bit lighter um, than it would be if you were doing, say, like a Tom Clancy thriller or something like that. Um, so Tom Clancy is very plot heavy. Uh, but you know, something I'm trying to think of something a little bit lighter, you know, or Stephen King was we'll just compared to bestsellers. Stephen King's very character heavy. So his plot is, you know, Stephen King's plots are not bad. He tends to, to be what's called a pants writer. He just kind of writes as he goes. Uh, so his plots are not bad necessarily, but they're, the focus is very, very much on the characters, which is why people get so attached to certain Stephen King stories. Um, I think, uh, you know, the, the the Dark Tower series really focuses on the characters. And even though it's a pretty rich world, it's mostly the characters that, that carry the story. If you were to look in the cinema, uh, the cinema area, say, comparing the first Star Wars movie, Star Wars 77, to Empire Strikes Back, 
you'll see a marked difference. So Star Wars, the original, has perfect balance between all three elements. Empire Strikes Back, the balance is heavily towards the characters, and the plot as a result is quite light. So Empire Strikes Back has the least amount of plot and plot events of any of the Star Wars movies, any of them. But there's a reason why it's the most loved, and that's because it focuses on the characters. It, with something like a movie, you can really see that you only have two hours to work with, maybe a little bit more, but you really are pretty limited on, on how much stuff you can have. So if you want to have that character drama, then the plot has to be a little bit lighter. And if you want to have a heavy plot, that means there can't be quite as much character drama. And you may have to focus really on one main character. And so that's another thing. If you're going to focus on plot, that it doesn't mean that you can't have interesting characters. It just means that you, you can't give as much page time or screen time to the ensemble. You're going to have to really focus on one protagonist to carry the story through. So my stories tend to be kind of plot heavy, um, which means they have a lot of events. And because they have a lot of events, most of my stories, you'll notice, tend to focus on one main character. Now, there's a really good exception, which is Crown of Sight. Crown of Sight is very efficiently designed, and it goes through several different character perspectives. And I use those to actually achieve efficiency. So if you're emphasizing characters... One of the things you can do to achieve efficiency is use scene breaks and shift perspectives a lot because each character will have a perspective that will reveal something new about the, the plot in a very natural way that readers like and will also let you spend time characterizing each one individually, kind of put the whole thing together. So um, this one has, you know, the, the villain. It's got what I would call the main protagonist who's the prince. Um, his love interest has perspective in this, uh, as does a couple of auxiliary characters as well. So there's lots of perspective shifts. That's another way to achieve efficiency if you're going to have something that tends to be a little bit character heavy. So what do we have? We have scene breaks. We have, um, oh, we should talk about whether you're going to write in the first person or the third person. I just mentioned this before, and so I'll just reemphasize re it. If you're going to write in the first person, you can really write efficiently for that character. That means that you get to know that character really well. And because you're writing in the past tense, hopefully, you you automatically kind of get this memory filter when you're writing. So you can only include the details which matter to your story. That's also going to help with the story efficiency. Keep that length down. Um, let me think if there's anything else to, to sort of add on top of that. Those are some really, really good strategies to determine the length. The last thing I'll say is, the big thing that's going to affect the length, besides your style and perspective, um, <clears throat> how you use scene breaks, uh, how you emphasize setting character or plot, whether you use direct or, or indirect exposition, the big one is how many plots you actually have. So if you have a lot of subplots, each subplot is going to add to the length of the book. And so this will help you figure out how long your book is going to be. So for most people writing in a standard third-person personal perspective, meaning um, you're in the third person, it's in past tense, but you're really focusing on the perspective of one character in each scene, not moving. You can do omniscient where you're moving around or kind of semi-personal, like what, uh, say, James Clavell would do, which is he gets into the thoughts of each person in the room kind of one at a time in a fluid manner. That's a difficult thing to achieve well, I think. But let's say you're writing standard third person personal. A regular full-scale three-act plot was probably going to run out to, you know, 100,000 words if you're including every element. So your A story, if you just have one plot, your A story is usually going to be between 30 and 50,000 words. Okay, that's a full length story, all the plot things, surprise twists, defeats, 30 to 50,000 words. So how can we get 100,000 word novels if, if the plot is 30 to 50,000 words? The answer is because we have the subplots. And so if you have a love interest, all of a sudden, you're going to add to that at least half the value of your main plot. So if your main plot runs at 50,000 words, your love interest is going to be 25,000 words. Now you're at 75,000 words. And then if you add a C story, which would be like a best friend story typically, you're going to add another fifteen to 25,000. Before you know it, you're at 100,000 words for your story. Now, if you cut it really down, you could get it down to 60,000 words and have all of those elements. But if you want to get it really razor thin, it you can excise one of those. So Eyes in the Wall, this new story, really, it does have an A, B, and C story, but the C story is is quite light. Uh, and that's it's basically a love interest 
kind of C story, but it really kind of plays into this B story. Uh, there's really only two stories, which is one about madness and one about monsters. And so uh, it really kind of, you know, it's pretty efficient if you can cut one of those out. You can really make the story quite a bit shorter. Um, and all of this, the reason we want to make our book shorter is we want people to read through and never get bored. The longer your book goes, the more likely they're going to get bored. And so uh, that's something to keep in mind. One of the things you'll notice with long series is, is each book has its own little arc. So each book is a story that contains all the story elements you need in and of itself, um, rather than it being one long story that you kind of chop into parts. Um, it's a little bit better way to do it is to have each story have a good little plot conclusion before you move on to the next series. Maybe leave a thread hanging that kind of keeps going, um, and that'll that'll help you keep it efficient, keep it short. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple of examples, I guess, of what not to do. Uh, and these are mostly in the fantasy genre because that's what I write and that tends to be what I focus on. Um, but just as an example, let's look at, if you look at Way of Kings. So Way of Kings is the first of the Stormlight Archive books by Brandon Sanderson. And I think it's a very good book. Um, it really, I thought it was a great book when I read it, but um, going back and doing analysis of it and how I felt about all the parts, what I realized is the book uh, is twice as long as it needs to be. And it's twice as long as it needs to be because it includes a large portion of a plot which is disconnected from the main plot. And this is something that some people call like plot weaving, which is you have like three different plots going on and they're all supposed to line up at the end. Steven Erickson does this uh, better than Brandon Sanderson, in my opinion. It's not that Brandon Sanderson's bad. It's just Steven Erickson really um, is able to kind of bring things to like some kind of weird mutual conclusion at the end of his books. It's kind of, it's kind of cool, actually. He's, he's pretty good at it. Um, but if we look at Way of Kings, we have... The main story is about this guy, Kaladin, who uh, it's a great story about him being busted all the way down to slave and then becoming a hero. Uh, very good, very good story. Most of the exposition of the world happens through that story, not really through this other plot that's existing, which, which is this character, um, Shani, I think is her name. And this second plot takes up a huge portion of the book and doesn't really show you that much about the world. It shows you a little bit. It does expose the setting a little bit, but it doesn't relate anything to Kaladin and pretty much goes nowhere by the end. It's a, it's a very, um, it's, it's not fully realized and you don't really get her to do anything until she ends up back in the same place as Kaladin really at the end of the second book. So you have these two plots which have nothing to do with each other until you get to the end of the second book where they finally line up. In my opinion, I would rather write um, one book that's just Kaladin and another book that's just Shani and then have a third book where they where they line up. Um, and so because he was trying to do these two plots, of course, the first half of the second book, nothing happens. It's really boring. So by the time you get to the second book, you get slogged down in just... Um, nothing. There's a whole lot of nothing. There's plot events which don't matter. There's character regression. There's discussion about things you already know. And then the last 100 or 200 pages of the book, finally a bunch of cool stuff happens and uh, you finish the book. So it's a great example kind of of what not to do is that even though the first book's very well executed, it really didn't need to be as long as it was. And you add into that, what Brandon Sanderson does is he has all these interludes that indirectly expose the setting. So there's characters you know nothing about. They have nothing to do with what you're reading about, but they expose some critical part of the setting and give you a clue as to what's happening. And he does it entirely through indirect exposition. And it's very, it's very compelling. Like it's very effective, but is it necessary for the plot of the book? So if you uh, are looking at something like Way of Kings and you're like, this book is too long and too boring, the reasons are because of what I stated. There's too much stuff in there they didn't cut it down to the main story, which is Kaladin. And if they had just focused on that, or if he had just focused on that, you'd have a shorter, more efficient, probably more entertaining book. It's not to say Way of Kings is bad, uh, because I really, really did enjoy it. And Brandon Sanderson does a lot of things well. But by the time you get to the second book, you see that that setup really has some big flaws and that we still don't have anything coalescing. We still don't figure out what's going on. We get to the third book, we have even more of that. So uh, as each book in the series happens, this um, this attempt to have like four different indirect exposition kind of things going on, interludes, plots that don't line up, 
gets to the third book and you just get completely slogged down to where you're not interested. Nothing is going forward. Nothing's happening. Nothing's exciting. Um, we're continuing to characterize characters we've known for you know 2,000 plus pages. It tends to get really, really slow. Um, so that's an example, I guess. I would caution anybody to do that. Um, if you really like those Stormlight Archive books, you can attempt to do that, and there's definitely readership for it. But uh, it's not something that I think is optimal. Uh, and it's not what I think is optimal as an author or as a, you know, or as a reader. I've already mentioned, um, I've already mentioned, you know, the Miles End Book of the Fallen has some of the same things going on. Um, there's so many different characters and everything's done in direct exposition. Lots of readers are turned off by that. So I already mentioned, I already mentioned that one. The last one is really something that a lot of fantasy fans, it's kind of ubiquitous, is those middle books of the Wheel of Time series. Those middle books of the Wheel of Time series are almost unreadable because they just go on and on and on with characters. The characters are talking. You have 50 pages for them to like walk to another room and have another conversation about nothing. So you're not re you're not revealing anything about the world. The world's been exposed by book six. The characters should be acting but instead of acting, they're kind of flailing their arms about, uh, kind of passively reacting to very minimal events. Um, by the time you get to like book eight, book nine, like Winter's, what is it called? Winter's Heart? Um, just nothing's happening in the book. The whole book could be summarized in like two paragraphs. That's a big problem. And a lot of, to the point where even the fans of Wheel of Time were like, the story, <laughs> the story's got better after, after Robert Jordan died. Uh, and Brandon Sanderson took over the series. So again, you know, I guess the relationship between those authors and possibly some of the same pitfalls. Uh, so if you're focusing intently on characters, but there's no plot, people are going to peace out. They're going to get bored. So there's two really good, um, two really good examples there. So let me go ahead. Let's take a look at the chat. That's going to kind of conclude the lecture for today. Hopefully you found that interesting. Do please pre-order uh, Eyes in the Walls. It's a, uh, it's, if you like straight horror stories, I think you'll like this one. It has a cool surprise towards the end. I think a lot of people will enjoy. So please check it out. It comes out on December thirteenth, two thousand nineteen. If you're watching this far in the future, that's not the link I wanted to link. I wanted to link. That's the link to this live stream you're watching now. So you can click that and come right back here. There's a link to the Amazon page right there in chat. So thanks so much, guys. Uh, let's take a look at the chat. All right. By the way, if you want my attention in chat, make sure you put at David Stewart. That way I know you're trying to talk to me, not trying to talk to each other. This is a stream I've been looking into since I was planning on eventually writing a long book I wrote in high school. And when I do, I am debating on breaking it into a trilogy. So um, let's talk business. Breaking it into a trilogy has some big advantages. I kind of did that with Needle Ash. I wrote the whole, I wrote all three books in one month and then broke them up into three different books for one for each act. So, so they look like now I really want people to buy the complete edition because the complete version, like these three makes up Eternal Dream Part 2 and Eternal Dream Part 3 will come out next year. Um, and so that's really where I'm going to, that's going to be kind of the classic long series and i might i might introduce that book in as, as a three-part trilogy as well like this but we'll see um we'll see how that goes this one is more this is gonna be like 12 parts just adventure all the way through um so breaking it up into three parts can have some marketing advantages first of all you can sell the first you can actually make more money so if you sell one hundred and twenty thousand or one hundred fifty thousand word book for um say 2.99 that's a lot of words to sell for $2.99, but let's say you let's say you want to price it at $4.99. A lot of people won't buy the book at $4.99, but they'll buy a book at $0.99 cents or free. So you put the first one out for free or $0.99, cents and people will get it. And if they like it, they'll buy the second one for $1.99, and they'll buy the third one for $1.99. You sold something for, um, for you know, Three ninety nine, you made four bucks. Or you know, they buy the first one at ninety nine cents, and they buy the next two at two ninety nine, and you have seven dollars worth of sales instead of five dollars, and you might have sold more books, and um, you get a click through, you get higher author rank on Amazon, doing things that way, and you also get this opportunity to to sell the first book in the series. You get most of your reviews on that, so that's the part that that gets sold really heavy to people, um, and that's a uh, 
it's just it's a good it's a good business strategy. I wouldn't do it if um, if you feel like the book is going to be part of a series itself, um, because then it gets a little confusing, like what I've been talking about. Film Girl says, I tried to pre-order your book, but it says it was unavailable in my country. Sometimes it doesn't show up in the UK for like a day or two or in Europe. And that's just kind of how it works. It, it, this went live like a couple hours ago. So I, I submitted this for pre-order maybe, I don't know, 18 hours ago. So it, it just it's still going live in different countries. So I apologize for that. Um, the Lord of the Rings movie came out in the early 2000s, but they were about three hours a piece. Yeah, well, um, so they were originally about three hours a piece, and then they were closer to three and a half to four for the extended editions. Now, I actually like the extended editions because they contain more critical character development and especially more plot, especially that that third one, Return of the King. They cut a whole thing where they're traveling through Mordor that's really interesting and really heightens the feeling that of desperation and the ring weighing on them. I, th I think they're more effective movies as longer movies because they contain more of the parts of the story that really matter to me. I think it's very hard to cut Tolkien down. Um, <laughs> for how short Old Man in the Sea was, I found it boring. Most people did. And it's because there's only, I think, two plot events. Um, there's he catches a fish and there's the shark eats the fish and he goes home hungry. So there's only two plot events for 30,000 words. Like you could write that in 3,000 words. Um, I, I think that one's chosen for, for Hemingway because they always choose like one from every author. They choose a Steinbeck, usually of Mice and Men. They choose a Hemingway. It's usually Old Man in the Sea because they're short. Of Mice and Men is short. Old Man in the Sea is short. But they are, each of those is to me not representative of the best work of those writers. So if you're going to read Steinbeck, you should probably read Grapes of Wrath. I think it's a much better book. Um, and if you're going to read Hemingway, you should probably read For Whom the Bell Tolls. Um, this are, yeah, it's probably, no, it's probably his best book. So I would probably say we're reading the wrong books. It's better to read a longer book that's interesting. Um, but at the same time, early modern, I think early modern books tend to be wordier in some sense, in some sense for the amount of plot and 19th century stuff was very wordy because they kind of sold it on a huge amount of reading time. Um, especially if you're reading say mid 19th century stuff, even, um, even Dickens can be very, very wordy. Uh, but there's also a lot of, there's also a lot of stuff that happens in those two. Um, $5 from Darth Kilhoom. Thank you. I'm writing alt history and I'm debating once done with draft to divide and tweak them to be like Japanese light novel where the book uh, the book is an arc in a greater plot. Now, so this is a, a great question. So I'll tell you a couple things. First of all, alt history is a very thin genre, meaning there's not a lot of readers for it. So if you can cross over into some other genre where you get a lot of readers, you could get a high ranking in say an alt history I don't even know if alt, alt history is a is a Kindle genre, but you could actually get a higher ranking by writing light novels in it that get a light novel audience. Um, I've talked. I've kind of considered writing basically light novels next year as a, kind of an experiment, including like isekai kind of stuff where it's like portal fantasy. Um, if you're not familiar with that, it's just like a rise in another world. I read the the businessman one, right? So. Think about doing some stuff like that. It could be, but it depends on how long each one's going to be. So if you can divide it into like 50,000 word chunks, um, that might work. If it's going to be too much shorter, like if you're dividing it into 30,000 word chunks, I don't know. There may not be enough there. I know I write 30,000 word books, but uh, <laughs> you know, I, I kind of think about how normal people write. Um, so I don't know. It's not a bad idea. It's probably a good idea if, if it's going to be your first work to have like a series up so that you can have that first book for free or for very cheap and you can really promote it a lot and get people to invest in it for free. So if you can get readers because they don't know you, they don't know anything about your work, if you can get them to invest in your work for free, then you're... Um, you're going to do a little bit better. So I think it's probably a good idea. You can, and of course, if it doesn't work out, you can always just put them in one book and republish it later. You know, um, you, all, you can always try that stuff out. 
pre-ordered Eyes in the Walls. Thank you, Mothman. I appreciate it. A lot of people like the last horror book, um, Voices of the Void. So hopefully people will like this horror book. This one's much more straightforward. It's Monster in the Basement or Monster in the Attic. Uh, but there's a there's an interesting twist at the end that I think people will, will really like. Uh, and if you if you were around for the spooky stories when I actually outlined this story, but there's new stuff. There's more stuff than I outlined because I wanted to make a longer story. So it, this is the story that I outlined live and started writing live on the stream. Um, I just wrote it and I spent two weeks writing it and, and now it's done. I spent a couple days designing this cover. If you want, I can talk about cover design in another video or I could talk about it today. Um, a couple of elements for designing horror covers. Maybe I'll get to that at the end. I'll talk about a couple of the little things I did here, which are, I think are interesting. Um, some movies are able to be quite long, as long as the pacing and the story's execution is done really well, as well as having very good characters in it, like Lord of the Rings. Another one, if you want a non-fantasy, is Heat. Heat is quite long, um, by Michael Mann. But you have these great characters. Every character in it has an arc, has something that happens to him that's meaningful, and you have a ton of plot and intrigue. It's really great. Let's see here. Cover looks really cool. Thank you. Uh, it's actually a very simple cover. I'll, I'll explain it. Um, is it unrefined to have a book that's mostly dialogue? No, that's what you want. Um, I don't mean the mostly expository speech style Lord of the Rings, but casual conversation. I want my book to sound classic. No, if you're going to err on any side, it's more dialogue versus more prose. Prose tends to be what readers skip. Readers never skip dialogue. Uh, this is an old thing that writers have known about. Elmore Leonard, if you read Elmore Leonard as an example, it's very dialogue heavy. Stephen King's very dialogue heavy. There's a reason why those writers are popular. The characters really speak through dialogue, not through prose. And you wanna lean on prose if there's a lot of things you need to describe well. Yeah, of course, you need to have prose. But especially if the story tends to be mostly about character drama, it's gonna be mostly dialogue. Um, and that's fine. This book, Eyes in the Walls, is mostly dialogue. It really is. Why don't you usually like to read first-person stories? Okay, I answered that. It's because I, I know that the narrator will survive. Do certain narrative styles like first-person or third-person go better with longer lengths? Yes, I think so. Personally, I think first-person perspective is great for shorter books. So Dresden Files, I think, is the max length that I can stand first-person. And I think those might be too much. But... Lovecraft stories, those are in first person. Um, a lot of Conan stories, you know, Conan stories, first person. Um, there's nothing wrong with first person, but if you're writing like an epic fantasy novel, first person tends to get a little worn out with something like that. First person is very well adapted to very personal stories focusing on one primary protagonist. So it's not so much length as it is what it what it's really good at. So it's really good at giving you the insight of that one character. You know, Twilight's written in first person. There's a reason that's a great choice for a book like Twilight that focuses on the character drama and especially the experience of the main character, Bella Swan. Um, whereas Harry Potter is not written in the first, just taking two children's literature examples. Harry Potter's not written in the first person because we have a lot of description to do that Harry Potter does not know about. And we also don't want to know that Harry Potter survives really, okay? Uh, when reading, I find the fear of madness is far more disturbing than the fear of death. Then you will like this book because that's that's the main theme. Am I crazy or not? Same thing with Voices of the Void. Voices of the Void, it's a little bit lighter. We know things are real, but we don't know how crazy he is. In this one, we don't know if he's actually experiencing reality or not. Billy, the main character, we don't know if he's actually experiencing reality. Um, I have another book where characters are wandering the countryside over the course of weeks and months. Any suggestions on how to make it seem like time's passing naturally without uh, making it seem like conversation con continuity is cut off? I mean, if months are passing, how can I control the reveal of information through conversation? Use scene breaks. So that's a, that's a very good question um, from Christopher. Use scene breaks. So have a scene break happen and then you can reveal that it's autumn. Let's say, let's say months have, have passed. You know, so the first one, they're underneath green trees. Next scene, they're underneath, the next chapter, you know, they're underneath autumn leaves. So you give a very obvious clue to the reader that time has passed. Or they can refer to it, you haven't told, I haven't seen you in months, you know, stuff like that. Fernando, great channel, Dave. Thank you. 
I'm a pantser. I prefer the term gardener. That's what George R. R. Martin says. Uh, the characters are the story. Yes, I think I think if you're going to err on any side, it's characters. I think characters need to be good. That's what people connect with. It's what they attach themselves to. It's people because we're social beings. Um, any tips on executing a fourth act? My plot concludes before one character's story concludes. It shouldn't take more than a chapter to do it, but I don't want it to just seem tacked on. It's hard. Um, if it's, I mean, if you can make them concurrent, make them concurrent, or try to add some weight to the extra conclusion. So this new book, Eyes in the Wall, kind of has that. You'll, if you read it, you'll find that there's a major resolution for there's what you think is a major resolution, but it turns out it's not. If you look at a movie like um, Revenge of the Sith, that's actually it's a three act story that then has a fourth act. So the third act should conclude with they've defeated the 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 droid menace, they've defeated the the uh, the separatists, but then you have the murder of the Jedi at the end of that. And then you have an extra act, this fourth act, where all the drama gets turned around on its head. So if you can add some extra stuff to that fourth act to really, you know, make that plot conclusion have impact after the fact, then that's good. Like there's some lasting effect from the plot conclusion. A character has some major problem with that. Even in Lord of the Rings, the hobbits come home to find the Shire has been destroyed. There's an extra little story there, but it's a very important one. Um... So I wouldn't worry too much about it. You know, you don't have to do it the way everybody does it. And in some cases, an extra ending can be really original feeling. And I hope it will in this one, in Eyes in the Wall. Hardwick. Much classic horror, Dracula, Frankenstein, much of Poe and Lovecraft is written in first person. Yeah. Finally, this helps me feel the intensity of the protagonist's emotions. I agree. It really helps you get to that one person. I just say it's not my favorite, and I feel like a lot of kind of pulpy garbage has been written in first person, and that's that's probably part of it, because I really do like Dracula. I really do like Lovecraft. Um, as I say things, I realize like I, I'm kind of being contradictory, because there's lots of things I love in first person. Um, let's see here. My sci-fi with dark comedy elements is written in first person. My intention is to make the comedy stand out a bit more since it's filtered through the character. What do you think? I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, I mean, it's going to be execution. I think comedy works a little bit better in first person in general because you can kind of tell jokes in the prose too. Um, I have two plots in the same book that happen over the course of months but at different paces. Any tips on how to edit these two since quite a lot happens in one plot over a short time? Um... I'd say just just tra- tell it chronologically as best you can, because um, if they kind of come together at the end, you don't want to spend. It's really hard to just spend a bunch of time on one plot that's happening in one chronological place, uh, or just leave some of the chronology a little bit out of it, um, so the chronology is not the focus. A lot of times we focus on technical details like are these things happening at the same time even though they're in different places and maybe one's happening a week later but that doesn't mean you can't put them next to each other as long as you're you know the reader gets that they're happening in different places and maybe even different times. It's not going to bug them too much. Um, in fact in Way of Kings that's what that's what Brandon Sanderson does. Uh, character regression huh? sounds a, a bit like what happened in the sequel trilogy. Yeah so the character regression in um the Stormlight Archive is Kaladin has kind of ascended to be hero at the end of the first book. And rather than him going forward with that, he instead, they bust him back down to like prisoner and make him go backwards. And he starts acting like he was like, he never learned any of the lessons from the first book. And it becomes really annoying because we want him to keep moving forward, not going backwards. But I think Sanderson needed to knock him down to enhance like this further ascent so he gets knocked down and then he gets even more powerful at the end of book two um will of time would have made a nice tight six book series instead it was bloated way out there yeah i I, honestly i would say if you want to read real of time read the first at least the first five i think are good like once you get to book six there's a little bit of a crossover book six it starts to be slow book like seven eight nine are not good. <laughs> Book 10 starts to get good again. 
and the Brandon Sanderson trilogy starts to get really good again. So it might be like read read book one through six and then read some detailed summaries of seven, eight, nine, and then jump back in at 10 and you'll probably pick up all the stuff that you missed because one of the things Robert Jordan tends to do is, and and I think this has to do with publishers wanting to sell like book 10 in a series at an airport. He tells you everything you need to know from the previous book, every single book. So that's, that is a thing that tends to slog down his books a little bit at the beginning um, in that series is that you get to book 10, he's basically telling you all the stuff you already missed uh, because people would be picking up the book after years. There's a lot of reasons why you do that. Um, but you could, have, you could probably skip those and just go to book 10 or read a summary, go to book 10 and then read 10, 11, 12, 13 and be done. Um, what's the best way to show a passage of time in my story? A and B story are more or less entwined or happen over the course of a year. Um, show, yeah, show the seasons. Make, give a clue to the reader is when it is like, you know, if they're students, they, they're meeting after taking their finals. Okay. We know it's May and you know, they're, they're meeting on their vacation. They're, then we know it's summer. Um, the leaves are falling. We know it's autumn. That's a really easy way. And the other thing is people care more about outcomes than like what exact, how much time exactly has transpired. So just keep it going forward and use scene breaks appropriately and it'll, it'll work. A lot of people have, they're like, these things are distant in time. I'm like, I just put a scene break and then this, or a chapter break. And then it's next time. Like, oh, I got break, you know, we'll miss a couple days on our journey. Who, like if we're just walking through the grass for two days, we don't need it. Tolkien would, would say for like a paragraph, they like walked for two days. <laughs> you know, you could do that too. Um, so Tolkien, instead of using scene breaks, would use very short prose to describe where they went and what they did and just leave out all the dialogue that they may have had. And just only have the dialogue that matters, right? So that would be what Tolkien did. Sound engraver. If you write an epic science fiction work with three or more installments, would it suffice to have story A only in the first installment? Can B and C be developed in subsequent books? So, okay, this is a great question. So usually what you're going to do in a series is as the series goes on, you're going to be bringing in more of those additional stories because the... Um, you establish the goal of the arc, hopefully at the at, in the first book, and as you go in each book in the series, you can bring in more of those auxiliary elements. You can have more auxiliary characters speaking. If you look at Wheel of Time, maybe this is a bad example because we're talking about how bad it is. It starts with Rand, but it's just on my mind. It starts with Rand Althor. He's clearly like the main character, but as we get to the mid books, like book two, three, four, we get a lot more of you know, pair, uh, you know, his friend, Perrin. My gosh, I'm forgetting their names. You know, we, you know, we get all those Vail and Perrin or whoever. We get all of those, all of those extra stories. So yeah, it's it's appropriate to do that, uh, as long as you can keep the reader interested and as long as there's progress towards that A story. You never want the reader to feel like, well, nothing happened towards the goal. You always want to feel like at least there's a step towards that ultimate goal, and then all of the stories that you're telling in that subsequent volume are somehow contributing to that. So maybe you tell a story about an auxiliary character and he's having a love interest, but that love interest, like if it's a sci-fi story, maybe it's like space opera. I'm going to imagine a space opera. He has a love a love interest and it turns out she's the princess of this planet and they need this, but, but by using her, she's able to like commit some of her army troops to win a battle at the end that they need to win. You know, so the, the B and the C elements, you know, these additional plots um, contribute to the movement of that A story towards the main story. I think that works pretty well. And I've seen a lot of series do that and do that really well. Uh, another way to write a series is just every book is a separate plot, you know? Can we get a right stream playlist on the channel? Oh, you know what? I can do that. Yes. Uh, that actually would not take me long because they they actually did do an improvement in the YouTube studio to where I can just click the live button and it shows me all the live streams. So I can just click them all and make a playlist for you. It's going to be like 100 hours though, or like 150 hours because these are like two hours a piece and I'm getting close to 50 of them. It's going to be long. <laughs> Finished Way of Kings less than five minutes ago. Really enjoyed the book. Do you recommend the sequels? So you're going to want to read the sequels if you really liked Way of Kings, but I think... I found way less enjoyment of way of, of the sequels of um, Oathbringer is the third one. What's the second one? Uh, 
I don't remember the second one's name right now. It's on my bookshelf somewhere. Um, I, I, they're not, they're not terrible. The book two's, I think book two's probably the worst of the set. It really, book two should have been the Empire Strikes Back, like lots of, lots of big things leading up to like a big defeat, but that didn't happen. Um, they just kind of waffled about. So you'll, you'll want to read them, but you probably will enjoy them less. Have you read A Throne of Bones? I have. Uh, I liked it. Um, one of the things I liked about Throne of Bones was each little, first of all, there's a lot of indirect exposition. So if you like these hints at like there's werewolves attacking this area, um, there's a lot of drama between characters, which is good. So the characters are all really well written. Um, they're all, they are, they're all there themselves. So they're all different and unique. But I like the setting because you had this, you had this uh, Roman like arm. This had this, country that's based on ancient rome you have one that's kind of more medieval northern europe um you have elves which are their own thing uh it's just it's a big mixture of familiar elements in ways that are kind of unfamiliar so i probably enjoyed the the setting um the most but i did enjoy the character drama um if i were to have a criticism against it it would be that there's kind of like george r, r. martin um is that it it doesn't kind of it doesn't kind of pound through the plot through the plot like what I like in, in a book. So it's uh, it takes a long time to get through the plot elements because there's lots of different things happening at the same time. And in some ways, I might say there's probably a little too much story for one volume. like Kind of like Way of Kings, you could, probably could have split that up into a couple different books. I enjoyed it, though. I haven't read the sequels. Um, so I haven't read the sequels. I read that one. That was the only one out when I, when I read it. Did you get my email about the Ike Perlmutter situation in Marvel Studios? I don't th think I did. I'll check my email. I'm, it, I might have and it didn't forward. So I have a bunch of email accounts and they all forward to one. Sometimes they don't forward. I go try to make it a point to go back through and manually check everything every couple days. Um, and I don't, I haven't had a lot of time to sit down at my computer and not like be intensely focused on my work the last week or two. So I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. Um, self-publishing lends itself to smaller books, but a lot of modern epic fantasy has multiple point of views, multiplying the necessary length. Would you recommend breaking it into more segments? I don't think multiplying the point of views necessarily multiplies it because this is short and it has multiple point of views. I think it's more that they are putting fluff in those point of views. They're putting too much stuff in, but that's a good point. Self-publishing stuff, it can be any length you want it to be. If you're trying to go trad pub, it has to be, especially if it's your first book, it has to be a certain length, like 100,000 words or less. And if you're writing fantasy, it could be a little bit more, like 120, but probably not too much more than that. Uh, or they're going to be like, it's too long. I don't know why trad pub wants to publish longer versus shorter books. I'm not sure why that is, but they do. Um, or writing shorter books and avoiding epics and self publishing. I consider, you know, um, Moonsong is going to be an epic. Moonsong is an epic. Eternal Dream is an epic as well, but in Eternal Dream, each book, each book is a separate story that contributes. So, Eternal Dream is written in a way that most books are not written, um, and so I don't know if everybody's going to like it, but it's the way that I'm going to write that series. And Moon Song is more traditional; it's the same characters banging on every single every single book is a new plot going towards a very big ultimate end that I haven't even you're not even going to really know what that ultimate end is till you get towards the end. Each book has its own plot direction. Um, let's see here. Might be a silly question, but what's the best way to present dialogue in my book? Like within the paragraphs or like one line after the other? I don't want, oh, one line after the other. So this is a formatting thing. I'll just show it to you. Um, let's open up a Word document. Blank document. Okay. Let's see what this looks like. All right, so whenever you're writing dialogue, every new speaker is always a new paragraph. So, hello, he said, extending a dirty hand. Indeed, Marjorie said. She didn't, um, she continued to hold onto her purse. What can I do you for? Now notice I'm not gonna put any pros there because we already know who's, who's speaking. 
I'm looking for Mr. Smith. She said. She sniffed loudly. As if the smell of the motor oil was manure. Okay. Now we want to have some more. If he is available. So all of the directions, think of, you know, if you're familiar with writing screenplays, all of the directions are going to occur within the paragraph of that speaker. So if you have parentheticals, you're going to convert those to prose. It's the same idea. So you might have a parenthetical sniff loudly. So with this, you know, she sniffed loudly as if the smell of the motor oil was manure. And then you continue the dialogue, if he is available. Right. I'm going to name him Gerald. He'll probably be back drunk. All right, see how just each line is a different speaker. And then maybe we add a new one. Hey, Jerry. Jerry turned to see Michael. You know, we introduce a new one. Actually, we'd probably put that as the same line. <laughs> Young man was positively caked in grit. Who's the looker? And we could have a direction. Marjorie turned her nose up. None of your business. There we go. All right, so there's a little little bit of dialogue. So each line is a separate thing. This is a formatting thing. Um, and that's, that's going to be the easiest way to do it. And if you just have two characters, I just occasionally put a he said or some kind of physical direction that, that shows some, you know, them moving or winking or, you know, doing something. And that does two things. It reminds the reader of who the character, which character is talking, because in the flow of da, 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 sometimes you could lose track, and also to just give a little bit of extra characterization for that moment. Why isn't the entirety of Rightstream 47 available to watch? There was a couple of seconds of personal information in it, my personal information. And so I haven't, <clears throat> I've tried to use YouTube's tools to blur that out. They don't work so good. So when I'm able to do that, then I'll, I'll put it up. And basically the lecture's up, but all of the discussion is missing. Um, because I, you have to anticipate your enemies, so I have can't have that stuff up there. I was thinking of making mine like that too. Did I? Um, I did divide mine like that because I wrote both parts as part of Nanorama. Oh, cool! All right. Um, I did really enjoy Voices of the Void as well. Glad left reviews for that in City of Silver. Working through your other books so I can review. Thank you very much. I appreciate that a lot. Um, They'll be, they're going to be different. You know, they're all different. If you're into horror, Muramasa Blood Drinker is probably the closest one. There's definitely some horror elements in it. Do you write out numbers or write numbers? Great question, um, Zimamaru. So rule of thumb is if it's a small number, you write out it as a word. One time. Two times. Right. Right. That comes out to so you end up with stuff that's like that. It comes out to $1,135.50. Now it'd be very cumbersome to write out 1,135, so you tend to just put that as numbers. So anything less than 100, you just do the word, and anything more than 100, you just do the number. That's the rule of thumb. You know, but you can, if it's short to say, like if it's 100, you write 100. If it's like 537 and a half, then you might just write it as a number, especially if it's in prose. If it's in prose, you kind of want to do that. So, you know, with stuff like that. Great question. On Amazon, I saw the thumbnail for a book called Pack Ebon Red. Although the book itself isn't my cup of tea, I found the cover striking. How hard is it to make a cover like that? I'd have to look it up. I can look it up real quick. What's it called? Pack. 
Eben Red. Let's take a look. Oh, this one. Okay, so first of all, this is an illustrated cover. Um, I'll show this to you guys. Um, so we'll talk about two things, which is the... Uh, I'll show it to you. Let me show it to you. Yes, I'll talk about two things with this cover design. One is the typography, which you can do. The other one's the illustration, which you probably can't do. Is this, uh, let me, I believe this is an illustration. It's, it's a painting. So let's talk about this. Um, here it is. So first of all, the typography. This is a black letter font and it's actually free. And I think I might have it. Combined with a piece of clip art, and this is also a piece of clip art to disturb and kind of make this fancy. It's typed with a with an italic style, um, and then you're arranging the letters so that they're very tightly packed like this. And I actually did something like this with eyes in the walls. Um, uh, I could talk just kind of a little bit about that, but um, so the typography. That's how you do the typography. And you'll notice that the typography is colored light, but it's slightly translucent or it's placed a little bit behind the main image. Um, what, they, what they probably did here is um, either made the, the type semi-transparent like in, in Photoshop, or you could actually do this in Inkscape. And there is a drop shadow on it. So this is done in, this could be done in either one, but it's probably done in Photoshop because of the transparency so that the underlying image you can still see through it a little bit and you can also paint on some more transparency on top of this um, and this typography down here is the same thing it's kind of see-through and the reason this works is that there's still a really strong contrast between this background color notice how dark this background color is and how bright this is and as we go down it gets a little brighter so there's going to be a gradient effect here as well as transparency there's still a drop shadow though to make it pop out extra if you didn't have that maybe you can't see it on your screen there's a very subtle drop shadow around all of this so this is a way to make your letters pop out without it looking most people have this like really hard line drop shadow you don't want to do that this is a piece of clip art um, that is then integrated into this entire thing which is made flat and uh, semi-transparent so you make this as a group in photoshop and then you you can put that on there I, um, and the little curly cues are, are extra things that you can add in. If you're doing this in Adobe Illustrator, this is actually a pretty easy thing to do. You can just drag onto the, you know, drag off the uh, off the letters, some extra, some extra points here to make these curly cues. You can also do this in Inkscape. Um, what you do is you make it, you go set object to path, and then you can make new points and do all this crazy stuff. Um, so this actually, I think, what core font this is? What core font is this? I think this is whole shrift maybe with some extra stuff. So that's that's the typography. The illustration obviously you can't do, but um, if we look at the color contrast, we have a woman with red hair, blue or teal. Red and teal, yellow and teal, really strong contrasting colors. They have a lot of emotion and mystery to them, that teal color. And the red tends to be either anger or passion. In this case, a little bit of both, like there's blood here. And it's called Pack Ebb in Red. Uh, maybe it's a werewolf tile, werewolf thing. I have seven alpha males as my, I'm a werewolf. There we go. Yeah, so it's a werewolf thing. Um, I have seven alpha males as my mates. I guess this is like a reverse harem. My boys represent the biggest packs in North America. Interesting. This is not the kind of book I would read. <laughs> but, but anyway, that's the, that's the cover design. Um, so I'll, the title text does a lot of work here. And this is just an, an illustration. Obviously, you won't be able to do this, but if you were to, you could possibly do this with stock photos to make it look like this. It's possible this is a stock photo that's just been really edited a lot. Um, but you could do this with stock photos. You do this and you can do some splatter brushes that then have a little bit of, of a stroke on them. And then that's it. That's how you can do that. I did this kind of stuff with Muramasa cover. Um, if I were to try to photocomp something like this, it'd just be a couple pictures of trees, a gradient background, uh, a, a woman, uh, and then maybe I'd add this uh, as a I'd Photoshop this right here, like make a big red sheet and uh, you get like a red satin sheet, put that in there, blend this out and then splatter the edges with the, with the splatter brush in a different layer. 
and that's how I would Photoshop that together. It would probably take a couple hours to like do it well, uh, but I could possibly duplicate this. There's also this little thing. I'm not sure what that is. International best-selling author. That doesn't mean that much, by the way. I mean, I'm sure she sold a lot of books. Whoever seems stunnages, but whatever. Anyway, so there's that. My alt history is only going into part two now from Darth Kilhoon. Already 150,000 words. So by the time I'm done, it'll be around 300,000. So three to five books is what I'm thinking. Totally. That'd be a great three to five books. 100,000 words a book. That's a great trilogy or maybe 80,000 words a book for five. Um, I'm not sure. I'd probably try to go them on the little bit of shorter side. See, because if you do a, a rather short book one, then it's really easy to get reviews. The reviews on book one matter 100 times more than they do on the subsequent books because that's the entry point for the series. Uh, what do you think of the following Ray Bradbury quote? No, I never consciously place symbolism in my writing. That would be a self-conscious exercise and self-consciousness is def defeating to any creative act. I don't know. Um, better to let the subconscious do the work for you and get out of the way. The best symbolism is always unsuspected and natural. I think Tolkien might agree with that. Um I don't know. I don't do a lot of heavy symbolism. Like this symbolizes that. I don't do a lot of that. So I don't know. Off topic. What do you think of the movie The Taxi Driver? Oh, with uh, Robert De Niro. I like it. I haven't seen it in a long time though. I could analyze it. I want to do more classic movies because I kind of want to get people's minds off of like Marvel movies and just kind of the schlock that's really popular now. For self-publishing, is there an optimal series length along with book length? No. Is it all about parsimony? Aside from pure story demands, how do you decide series length? I don't uh, decide it besides story demands. Um, I'd say two books is not enough. It's You got to have at least three, but there's no upper limit. Um, at least there's people who write 20 book series and, and it seems to do really well. If you can keep a reader hooked. So here's the advantage of series, no matter their length. It's easy to sell the first book. It's easy to get people in on the first book. If somebody is really liking your story, they are, um, they're going to buy multiple versions. So if you have 20, 20 books in the series, all of them are $3.99. That, that person is going to spend $60 reading your stories if they like them. Uh, and so in order to keep readers continually engaged with your books, if you come out with frequent books in your series um, so that when they finish one, they can look forward to the next one. That's a great business practice. I don't really do that right now because I'm still figuring all this stuff out on some extent as far as writing stories. Um, I just put out the first Moonsong book because I just needed to put a book out. Sometimes I'm just like, ah, I gotta publish something. I have all these books sitting around, I gotta publish something, so I put it out. If I were gonna do it right, what I'd do is I would have not put this out. And instead, I would have put it up for pre-order, edited book two, put that one up for pre-order, edited book three, put that one for pre-order, each one a month apart. And so there's one coming out every single month for 12 months. If I were smart, that's what I'd be doing. Uh, I'm kind of working behind and I just, I needed to take a break. And I just, I wanted to write that scary story. I, that's just where the anvil was, you know, got to strike when the, the iron's hot. I got to do this monster story. And so I wrote it in, I wrote it in about 10 days, which is, not particularly fast for a story of that length for me. Um, but it was, and I've been so busy. I've been staying up late, you know. Um, I just made a decision. I'm like not going to skimp. You know, I'm never going to miss a workout. So it's like I've been at least doing cardio every single day um, to try to, you know, maintain my health. I've been working really hard to like be very on top of it. But that just means I've, I've only been writing, you know, one to 2,000 words a day. Yeah, I wrote 2,000 words yesterday on a new on another book. Uh, and that was, and I spent the rest of my time doing cover design and setting up pre-orders and stuff. Um, if I'm really good, I can do 5,000 words a day. If I, have, if I have time to write it. The problem is I just never have time. You know, I'm with my family from 6 a.m. till 9 o'clock at night. And then if I'm lucky, I'm off at 9 and I can go work out. And then uh, I usually work out to wake myself up a little bit because I get tired. And then I come back and I could do my, do my work. And then I do, you know, watch it watch something or read a book or play a game before I go to sleep. I have to, 
I didn't do this last night and I had trouble sleeping. So it's something I, I have to do something fun at the end of the day to just kind of let my mind go or I'm going to go to sleep and I'm just going to be thinking about like every little thing. Uh, it's a big problem with me. I have really, I really have a hard time unfocusing. Um, <clears throat> so there's no optimal series length. <laughs> do it as much as you want. Uh, in fact, longer series are probably better because you can continue to monetize it. And people years later can get into it and then they can just buy each book as, as they want. Can children's books incorporate child sacrifice? Oh my gosh. Uh, I have one that would typically be classified as a children's book, but the child sacrifice is an important plot point. Sounds bizarre, I know. Well, um, <clears throat> C.S. Lewis did it. Now, um, it was going to be the sacrifice of one of the ch children, but Aslan took his place. So it's Christ dying on the cross in your place. Symbolism. Symbolism. Allegory. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. It depends on how it's doing. If you have like some sort of graphic, like we're throwing the child in the fire. I don't know, man. Um, I'm not an expert on what constitutes children's literature and what's really appropriate. I have an idea of what's really safe and appropriate, but I don't have an idea of where those limits are in a hard way, you know? <clears throat> Have you read any books that were so bad you couldn't finish them? I have read many books. Well, I, there's a, what is it? There, if it's so bad you can't finish it, then you didn't read it? No. I have attempted to read books that were so bad I couldn't finish them. Many, 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 many books. A hundred books. Two hundred books. I don't know. A lot. So because my time is limited, because I can only live on this earth for so many years, I decided a few years back that I was not going to read bad books that I was going to give a book 50 to 100 pages to actually show me anything. And if after 50 to 100 pages I'm bored or I don't like it, put the book away. I have abandoned many books. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. If that book isn't selling you on the first 100 pages, it's probably not going to sell you on the next 500. Um, I really wish I had that rule when I was reading, when I was trying to read uh, Name of the Wind. The book was so boring. It was like the most boring 100, first 100 pages of any book, <laughs> of any fantasy book. It's like nothing happened. You know, it was just uh, so boring. Uh, and then it just, it barely got it more interesting as it went. It was just like barely more interesting. Um, and it just got more cringy as it got more interesting. Anyway, I don't like that book. I don't think it's very good. Um, are you familiar with the series of unfortunate event books? I've never read them. Sorry. Um, the book I'm writing now starts with a broken protagonist and throughout the story, he's slowly regaining himself. Is this a good character arc? Excellent character arc. I love that kind of character arc. Stories of redemption, people love those because we identify with people that are broken because we're always broken in some way. We're all sinners. Um, we're all fallen. We live in a fallen world. And so it's just great. Um, that's Way of Kings. Um, when you, it's uh, great expectations to some extent, right? When you said that a lot, a lot of pulpy garbage has been written in first person, what types of stories in particular do you mean? I mean like Twilight or like Hunger Games, which I don't, I don't want to just call them garbage because people like them. Um, but there's not a lot of substance, <laughs> you know. Uh, actually, I don't remember. Hunger Games is written in like first person present tense or something. It was really weird. It was extremely awkward to try to read that one. Or um, like Fifty Shades of Grey. It was written in first person present tense. It was awful. Awful book too. Um, not even like, I don't know. It's like erotica. is porn for people who don't like porn. I don't know. What, what is your opinion on stories that follow a formula? I was thinking of doing this for the first few books of my series and then breaking, changing it when the team comes together. I don't think there's any anything wrong with following a formula. You always got to have some variation though if you want people to keep it in, to, to keep it interesting. Got to have some twist. Got to have something that's unique. For, for most people, that's natural. They have a thing in mind that's the unique part when they begin. You know, they're not trying to make a formula. They're trying to tell the story, and the formula is just kind of a way to, to get their story off the ground. Don't try to make your stuff fit into a formula. Um, but if you use a formula, that's fine. Just try to think of, like, one thing that's different. One of the things I've been told is I'm good at writing dialogue from those who've read what I've written. Yeah, I mean, the dialogue is, is the main thing. Um, do you think that working at a mind-numbing job that involves boring mental work is harmful for a writer? Absolutely. 
I think it, I think, um, so here's the thing. It could be two things. If the work is mind numbing and requires your mind, it is terrible for creativity. I have learned this firsthand and I've learned this secondhand through numerous writers and aspiring writers that simply cannot cannot summon the focus and the drive necessary to do what they love to do in the absence of without them not having work. So if you are a teacher for instance, it's very it can be very mind numbing. But it also requires a lot of your energy. So you're completely out of energy at the end of the day, of mental energy. You've been you've been engaging yourself in mental stuff the entire day. It's really hard to to then focus intensely on writing. Um, and I know that from being a teacher and talking to other teachers who like to write books. Um, so teaching, I think, is a it can be a good job if you're a writer. And it was good for me because I really knew how to compartmentalize teaching and make it easy on myself so that all, you know, I wrote, I would write a thousand words a day before I even got off of work. You know, I wrote in the margins. I wrote during lunch. I wrote during my union break. I wrote the first hour after school when I had to like be around for kids in case they needed homework help or something. And then I'd go home. I'd be halfway done with all my work, you know, or more. So I could really get a lot of work done. But most teachers really are bad at that. Most people are really bad at compartmentalizing. I just happen to be really good at it. Um, maybe that's a strength. Uh, that's part of my personality. I think, um, other people are going to struggle with that. So teaching can be a terrible profession if you're a highly creative person, because you have to exercise your creative muscles all day long. And I taught music, a creative field. So if you're exercising your creative muscles all day long, you're exhausted from doing that. Like you just don't have the focus to continue. And because you're, you're dealing with a classroom, there's no release of your focus ever all day long. It's, it can be really hard to be a teacher. If you're doing something like accounting, I don't know. But accounting to me um, can, can be very mind-numbing. And therefore, when you get off, you need, a, you need a release from mental activity. You need to go do something else. If you can like get off of your accounting job and go work out and like just listen to some music and then go home and you're kind of released mentally, it's probably helpful. Um, but I think it's very harmful. Now, if you're if you're doing something that's mind numbing that doesn't involve mental work, like driving a truck, that can be very good for writing because you can listen to audiobooks. You, there's your reading. You can just be thinking about plots. If I like, you know, I kind of like mind numbing jobs like mowing the lawn because it gives me finally gives me time to think. I'm happy to mow the lawn or like work in the garage, clean up the garage, or um, you know, do something else. When I when I was just like a uh, you know. When I worked more industry jobs back in the day, it was, I had so much time to think, you know, uh, it could be great. If you're doing like a typist job, it's going to be pretty hard to refocus when you're done. Have you seen Netflix's new movie, Klaus? No. Or Claws? Uh, I could consider reading it and reviewing it. Well, maybe my kids want to watch it. I find a lot of novels start too late as if the story would be less boring in media arrest. Totally. A lot of a lot of novels try to um, they try to ease you into it. It's better to just kind of like I talked about that with Twilight. I don't know where the book is. I think it's still by my computer somewhere. They do that. They hook you in with that immediate rest so they can ease you into it later. Um, I think it's better to just start as quick as possible with action. You know, uh, City of Silver starts with like a witch being burned. <laughs> Spoilers: the witch gets burned. So you get a couple pages of that. Uh, and then you're right in conflict. You're right in intense conflict, people being murdered and being shot at all the way through. So um, I try to keep the action at the beginning. It's good to, good to front load it if you can. And if you're not going to, you need to at least have something that's really interesting for people to, to grab, a, grab onto. Something that just makes them really want to answer questions. Uh, someone getting murdered is great if you can do that. <laughs> In the context of your books, how do you define elves and fairies? Um, so the f the fey creatures in Water of Awakening, if you meet them, are not human. Oh, so I I don't want to get too deep into like my my world building on this, but like it's a descent. So elves, there's a couple variations of elves, and each one represents an earlier descent of the original beings. So the original beings started in 
the eternal dream, which is this realm of concepts, and have created the world out of those concepts basically through their own actions. It's kind of a weird weird way of looking at it. Um, it's kind of an interesting, you know, just different take on, on um, you know, mythological descent. Um, but the beings that live in, say, the Fae, the actual fairies, are not human at all. They're immortal, but they also... Uh, it's hard for me to describe. You kind of have to read the book. Um, they don't have any concept of permanence. So they don't have names. They don't have a name, right? And so when they have a name, it has big, profound effects on them. And if they just walk out of the Fae trying to be... They, they envy mortal beings because mortal beings create things of permanence. Mortal beings have meaning. So the, the beings of the Fae, the fairies, have no meaning to their lives. They simply exist in a perpetual, eternal, spirit-like state. Whereas the, when they step out of it, they quickly can become deformed and fallen because they lack the fundamental spark that regular people have to exist out in the world that is. Um, they're not made for it. So that's something you'll find. Whereas elves are really from an earlier descent of man, um, from an earlier version of the world that was less permanent. So they are kind of an in-between kind of race. And then um, you have the descent of the mortal races, which are the Drysen, which are kind of orc-like. Um, they're giant kind of savage creatures in some ways, but very imperial. And then you have men. Um, there's also, you know, I'll, I'll get into all that as we get more books. Um, so a good question. This lets me kind of talk about my books. Would I write uh, argument dialogue the same way, even if the characters cut each other off at some point during? Thank you for a demo that helped me a lot. Okay, let me write some of that. So if you just look at my notes, you... I draw a dash. Now here's the weird thing with word. When you draw a dash, it tends to put a backwards quote. So I do that. Shut up. Now listen, if, let me just put it a dash. There you go. I said shut up. Marjorie, you're pissed. <laughs> there you go. Um, when did authors start writing each chapter from a different character perspective? Dune was first. Is it a just trend or is it a timeless writing tool? Um, I seem to remember it in Dracula. So it's been around a long time. Uh, I seem to remember things like that in Paradise Lost perspective shifts. So it's it's timeless. Um, it's one way. It's, it's a good way to... Um, to move locations because if you move characters that that character's in a different location so if you're writing from the perspective of one character and then you know like dracula goes to london you go, you can do a different character and it helps you move to the new location um, if you're looking for classic movies to review i highly recommend the night of the hunter i'd also like to see an in-depth analysis of metropolis i do love metropolis i think that's a great one to look at um it's just so bizarre for especially for the time it was made I often find myself not writing nearly enough. Um, what do I do if, if I think there's nothing else to write and it's only like two paragraphs? Write a scene break. You know, I have scene breaks in Crown of Sight. That I have scenes that are like half a page. There's no problem with that. There's no rules. Bach, Bach wrote middle movements for some of his, um, you know, for some of his suites. He would write inner movements that were literally two measures. There's Bach pieces that have two measure movements. So you can be like, I'm going to play Johann Sebastian Bach, da 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 da, movement two. And it's just a, it's just a, a two five to set up moving to a different key. That's the whole movement, <laughs> you know? So Bach wrote two measures. You can write two sentences for a scene if you want. Um, let me find a short one, you know, like this. I don't know if you can see this. Uh, ah. This light is so bright on my face. Let's turn this off. Okay, now you can see. 16, 17. So this chapter 16, it's a page. That's it. Yeah, no rules. Do you think it's easier to have slow pacing in a book um, than in visual mediums? 
Yeah, no. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know how to answer this, man. Um, slow paced move. So pacing is about how quickly the plot events happen. And you can bore somebody in either medium. But sometimes if the execution is great, you can have something that's really slow paced and have it be super interesting. It depends on how much tension you're able to put in there. If it's a really tense scene between two characters and the plot isn't moving forward, it can still be really interesting whether it's a book or a movie. You know, imagine the beginning to Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, where it's like there's no dialogue at the beginning. It's two characters staring at each other, very sparse. Or um, if you've ever seen Valhalla Rising, same thing, just virtually no dialogue and just like big sweeping shots of landscape. You can do that as long as it's beautiful or interesting on some level. Um, you can You can avoid pacing you can have long things be poorly paced as long as they're really interesting hbo is making a his dark material series i don't know what that is sorry um just a basic frame to have in my head okay yeah we're talking about uh formulas uh basic frame to have in my head but the creatures and situations encountered and how they're dealt with are all unique from each other totally you gotta have something that that readers are like well that's new and interesting Hi from your weapons guard duty at Fort Sill. I hope you're having, hope you're doing well. Zul has been a great joy to listen to lately. Thank you so much for listening. I'm, I'm going to try to record a new album over spring break. I've been very, or over this next couple of weeks and months, been very hard to fit in music into that workflow um, since I moved to this house. It's been very hard for me. I don't know, like the juices haven't worked. Music is in some cases, it's more it's just harder to grab onto ideas. I can write formulaic music, but I can't stand doing it. I have to kind of, it just kind of has to come from a little bit deeper place. And so I've done some things, but nothing that I feel like releasing. I have a couple things in mind. There's some stuff I want to do. It's going to be Zool. Next album is going to be Zool, but more impressionist. So um, I have a couple things I'm working on. Hopefully I'll be able to actually create something. Um you said you want to review classic movies to get people's minds off of schlock. You mentioned the Marvel movies. How would you define schlock? And you think Marvel movies qualify? Like schlock just means like um, just basic stuff for like fast food. And you know, Marvel movies are kind of the fast food of movies. And that's the, not a bad thing per se. Like I know I'm using insulting terms, um, right? Because if you want a spicy chicken sandwich, you know, Chick Fil A is great. <laughs> Uh, if you want like filet mignon, maybe not. Yeah, maybe not. Um, so probably like Marvel movies, anything that's there to just kind of please the immediate senses and just doesn't have a whole lot of depth. And, and so it's just designed to be very stimulating, you know, immediate kind of fast food stuff. Uh, the new Star Wars movies are kind of fast food. Only it's like crappy, wet, soggy you know, soggy bun whopper from Burger King with cold fries. It's like it's a it may be entertaining, you know, it might kind of fill your tummy. Do you have any examples of stories that have bad dialogue but interesting plots? I would say episode one, a Phantom Menace, the Phantom Menace. I think the dialogue's not very good, and I think it's not well acted in a lot of cases, but the plot is actually pretty pretty cool. It's pretty good. Um, it's not bad at all. Uh, actually, I'd say probably episode two is probably a better example of not the best dialogue, but pretty cool plot, pretty good plot. I like the plot of episode two. Um, you said a while ago that you would do an analysis of John Williams' music. Is that still possible? So the problem with doing music analysis with and letting people hear the music like I really would love to do record analysis where we hear the music, but I can't make any money off of it and I can get strikes on my channel. Uh, and I learned this through experience. If there's any music at all in your video, it will get uh, copyright. Uh, it'll either get taken down or they will just steal your ad revenue until you can get it cleared. So it can take days, weeks. And in that, in that amount of time, I've just given all of the money I would make for my effort away to whoever happened to write that music. And not that I think John Williams shouldn't get paid for his music, but I'm doing an analysis. It's an educational endeavor and I'm doing it out of my time to 
further promote his music. Like I should I should be able to make some money on that. So I'm I'm heavily disincentivized with the way YouTube works from ever doing that. I have to do it basically out of the goodness of my heart, and I do most things out of the goodness of my heart when I think about it. But it's really hard to say like, hey, let me do some really some really cool music analysis and make no money from it. Not only make no money from it, but make money for other people. You know, that's just, that's what it is. My job is closer to accounting side of things than to teaching. I find it very mind numbing. Physical labor really releases my mind to daydream. Yep. And daydream and ponder. So I find it less boring. Same thing. So if it's a mental task, man, it really drains you. It's really hard. Um, if it's a physical task, it's great for writing because you're not, you know, you're, you're, you get bored and your creative mind just starts, starts doing stuff. You start daydreaming and coming up with new stuff. It's great. Um, I'd love to see you make an analysis on taxi driver as well as an analysis on the Godfather. Okay. I like the Godfather a lot too. What are your thoughts on Jerry Goldsmith? I like his music. And have you heard of the score for legend? Yes. Um, what? It's on the director's cut but is replaced by Tangerine Dream Score for the theatrical cut. What? I didn't know this. I'm going to have to look this up because I didn't know any of this. I'll look it up. Steve Brown, $5. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen Brown. I appreciate that a lot. I'll have to look that up. (laughs) I, I don't know this story. Since The Irishman is coming to Netflix soon, would you consider watching it and reviewing it? Yes. Um, I think my writings have at least the Cheesecake Factory level value. <laughs> Do you think the length of The Force Awakens is too long and the pacing is too fast? Yes, I think the pacing is too fast. And it's because they tried to put too much in the movie plot-wise. And they also kind of changed all the plot goals halfway through the movie. So you can kind of see where something happened and they were rewriting the movie as they went. They were going to go get Luke and right when they were about to go get Luke, it changes to we got to blow up the Death Star and they threw in a bunch of crap to cover that up. And I seem to remember J.J. Abrams basically saying we originally were going to have Luke come and train Lay, uh, train um, Ray right away and they didn't happen because they wanted to blow up the Death Star again. Any favorite uh, original soundtracks by Williams? Um, I mean, the original Star Wars, you can't go wrong with it. It's legendary score. It's extremely well done. Um, I actually, so this is a weird one. I both like and dislike the score for the first Harry Potter movie because, because of the way Chris Columbus directed and cut the movie, the score just kind of overpowers everything, but the music's really good. So it's really good, really moody music. It's like a perfect choice of instrumentation and orchestration for the story and for the setting. But for somehow the way that the movie's cut and shot, the score is kind of at odds with it. It's really, it's really a weird feeling. I'll, I'll, uh, maybe I'll, maybe I'll do another movie or another video on it some other time. But, um, next time you watch the first Harry Potter movie, if you ever feel like watching it, uh, you notice that like, the acting's kind of, I mean, it's all kind of hammy. Everything's kind of hammed up in kind of an almost cringy way as far as like the acting goes. Uh, visually, it's great. So if you if you were to watch it with like the dialogue off, it's just the score, it, it would be, I don't know, I'm going to try that because the score like kind of overpowers everything and it kind of has to because the dialogue, um, I mean, not the dialogue, the dialogue's not bad. It's just, it's, the especially the the what's his face the his his family he lives with initially the not the weasleys the weasleys are the redheaded ones you know his his uncle and them they're just acted in such a hammy way it's 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 bad <laughs> i'll do a full analysis on it some other time stephen brown you were you were a servant much appreciated appreciate it i really appreciate the five dollars um so yeah, I love the, the Harry Potter soundtrack as a soundtrack, but it's like, it doesn't fit right in the movie and something about the way the movie's made. I think you can make a movie that makes the score, that's at odds with the score. That's kind of what's so good about the original Star Wars movies, the original six. Every single one of them, the score and the movie just, it's like, 
you know, George Lucas and John Williams, George Lucas's stories and directing and John Williams's music, they just go together perfectly, especially the first Star Wars movie. And also, I would say episode three, um, as far as how they fit together just perfectly. Sometimes, you know, you put John Williams in like Steven Spielberg, it still works really good, you know, uh, but it's not as good as when Lucas does it. It's just perfect. Uh, as far as how those go together. Using the term as a descriptor, not an insult, do you consider your voices the void of schlock? Uh, no. I mean, you could call it like pulp, like if you're thinking of classic pulp. What what elements do you believe elevate it? Well, I mean, there's there's lots of stuff, right? Um, the, the actual descent into madness, um, the, the depth of the world that's hinted at it, the execution too. Uh, this is an idea. So just to just to clarify, this is an the idea of pulp versus literature is something that's 20th century kind of come up with by like academic writers who want to believe their stories are somehow more important than the stories that people read. <laughs> Do you think a corporation can be so bad that it becomes moral to steal or pirate from them since just passively not buying their products just isn't enough? No. No, um, so I can't think of something where it's moral to steal from them where you couldn't just avoid buying from them. Like, it would be like the, the power company is completely immoral and therefore, but you still need power. Like, you still have to have their product, but it's sold by an immoral company. Then I guess maybe you could write a justification for piracy. But we're talking about intellectual property. So, you know, if you think Disney is evil, there's hundreds of thousands of other movies and books to read you don't have to ever touch disney there's no reason to pirate it and in fact i'll do a video on this your attention is money if you are pirating it and giving them your attention you are basically giving them money because your mind is still focused on their product sooner or later they're going to want to they're going to find a way to monetize that or you're going to be talking with other people about it which is going to subtly enhance the value of it but hey man did you see the latest star wars movie yeah i pirated it oh yeah it was good then you're having a conversation about it and and enhancing the value of their brand so i can't think of anything where it's an elect an intellectual property where it's okay to pirate versus avoid avoidance is better than pirating Pirating is never really justified. Even if the company's evil, you're going to be doing more harm by avoiding them than by pirating it. Because pirating it doesn't, you know, pirating versus an avoiding is the same dollars to them. Only if you pirate it and then are giving it your attention and then talking with other people about it, you are enhancing their brand. And I'm aware I do that with Star Wars. But there's a flip side of that, which is that I run a content channel. So if I am giving attention to Star Wars, I'm also pulling people into my audience who then I can um, sell the things that aren't Disney. If you consider Disney evil, I don't, I don't think they've crossed over into the full-on evil territory. Other people um, are going to say that they're more evil. I think it's just, I think that they're pretty converged at this point. Um, Someone at Castalia House, not Vox Day, posted about Voices of the Void featuring the cover. Yeah, um, I think that was John Mollison. He does a lot of reviews. Um, I think he also talked about City of Silver. Um, so that's cool. I appreciate that kind of, uh, I appreciate that signal boost a lot, um, for sure. Uh, the U.S. version of Legend had the Tangerine Dream soundtrack, and the U.K. version has a classical score. Well, I want to watch the U.K. one. I don't know which one I've watched, um, but I'll tell you what, Ready, Set, Go. I will try to track down both versions and watch them and give an analysis because now I really want to give an analysis of that. I really want to compare those two. Uh, that sounds like something fun for me because I think it's a cool story. I think Tom Cruise is great, <laughs> so I'll check it out. I'll, that Maybe we'll, we can look forward to that in the next couple of weeks. Uh, William's score for Jaws is great and gives the right amount of tension for the scenes where the shark is present. Absolutely. I think it's a great score. I think Spielberg's a great director in being able to... I, I think some movies, you can direct a movie where the score doesn't fit in. I think Force Awakens was one of those. The score wasn't given the space it needed to really work. That was part of what part of the problem with it. John Williams wrote a good score, but it wasn't used. There were even parts of the score were, that were cut out. There you go. 
Ridley Scott hired Goldsmith to score Legend, but the studio didn't think the movie was profitable, chopped it up in editing, and hired the synth band Tangerine Dream to rescore it. See, yeah, this, I guess I, I, this sounds familiar, so maybe I know this story, or maybe I just never heard it. Most people are only familiar with the theatrical cut, which has the Tangerine Dream score. I much prefer the Goldsmith score and the director's cut of the movie. Well, now I gotta compare them. I gotta compare them. Do you think the prequels work at, as silent films? Oh, this is a cool one. Yeah. Speaking of silent films, do they need to have a different um, pacing from sound films? <laughs> So yes. Okay, so two questions. First one, prequels work as silent films. I don't really think they do. I think, I mean, you could watch them without dialogue and get most of what's going on there. Sorry, let me silence that. Um, so yeah, I think you could get most of what's going on there, uh, and which was something that Lucas really liked, the idea of really visually telling the story. Um, and silent films do need to have a little bit different pacing from sound films. And the reason is because you have to keep the dialogue to a minimum. You're going to show the dialogue in, in screens. So that's going to interrupt the visual flow of what you're doing, which means you've got to minimize the dialogue and do most of your storytelling visually. I think that actually improves the pacing. You'll find that dialogue interchanges can happen fast on screen for sure but they will eat up more screen time than just showing action and having one small piece of dialogue. I think you can actually tell a story a little bit faster in a silent movie uh, format. And I think you, if you watch some of the silent movies, I think that, that that can be the case. Are you saying the Harry Potter soundtrack speaks for the movie instead of the characters? I think it speaks for the, mo the characters better than the characters speak for themselves. That might be a way of putting it. I think it's a little, I think it's just at odds with the way the movie is presented. Um, the score, you know, there's the score is very fantastical during shots, which are not so fantastical. Um, it's a little bit at odds with the visuals in some cases. Uh, let's see here. What do you think world? What do you? Uh, what do you think would class as urban fantasy? Okay, what would classify as urban fantasy? The Dresden Files are a great example. The key components of urban fantasy is that it is. Um, our world, so it's a low fantasy setting, um, modern, and uh, contains significant fantasy elements. However, those fantasy, excuse me, those fantasy elements are almost always a little bit hidden from the main focus. So it could be our world, and we're just not aware of the vampires. That could be urban fantasy. It could be our world, we're not aware of the werewolves. That could be urban fantasy. It's our world, we're not aware of wizards. That's kind of Dresden Files. So in the Dresden Files, it's not fundamentally a different world from ours. It's just the supernatural elements are hidden. This varies from what people call ma magical realism, which is where the magic is out and normalized in our world. Um, this is, I guess, genres that are more popular in, in Spanish-speaking countries than uh, in English-speaking ones. Uh, but you you will find this in, in English novels as well. So it's the idea that, you know, it's our world, but there's wizards and we're, we know that there's wizards. So Harry Potter in some ways would, would actually classify as urban fantasy. But because most of the time is spent in a true separate world, this world called Hogwarts, where there's no electricity, it's all magic. It really is just more straightforward fantasy. I kind of call it low fantasy because it's in our world. Um, you know, the the stakes are not epic. We're not talking about epic wars. Um, so it's kind of more low fantasy, but uh, it's still in our world. You know, so you could you could possibly make a case that it's urban fantasy. But really, urban fantasy is more like Dress and Files kind of stuff. Or Highlander. Highlander is urban fantasy for, for you movie people. Um. You mentioned you recently played Final Fantasy VII. I'm looking forward to an updated original soundtrack to VII. Any favorite video game original soundtracks? Lots. So I really like the soundtrack to Final Fantasy XII and Final Fantasy XIII. If you get the new version of Final Fantasy XII, they redid it like with full orchestra and stuff. It's beautiful. That soundtrack's really good. Final Fantasy XIII just has a very eclectic mixture of things for its soundtrack that I just think is really cool. Um, I just really liked the soundtrack from Final Fantasy 13. So those are two modern ones that I think 
just have great soundtracks. If you want old stuff, Mega Man X is one of my favorites. Um, Castlevania IV is one of my favorites. Castlevania Symphony of the Night is also one of my favorites. So those are some old school ones that I think are just brilliant. Um, I really like the, the soundtrack to Final Fantasy VI, even though it's still like 8-bit. It's great. Um, or 16-bit. So I like a lot of the Super Nintendo soundtracks. I'd say my favorite Super Nintendo soundtracks are Castlevania IV um, and uh, Final Fantasy VI. Maybe Secret of Mana is also pretty good. Um Probably those ones are, are and, and Mega Man X. Those are those are probably my favorites. Newer ones, I mean, there's so many to, to think about that, that have great soundtracks. I feel like as the production of soundtracks has gone up, though, we tend to lose some of the sight of melody and like memorable lines because you can you can paint so much with textures. I'd say my favorite newer soundtrack is probably Elder Scrolls IV: Oblivion. This is a perfect impressionist soundtrack. It's in the background. It paints the mood. It just it can fill you with uh, all the feelings you need to feel when you're out exploring uh, that that uh, out exploring Cyrodiil. Um, all the Elder Scrolls soundtracks by Jeremy Soule are just great, but uh, I think Oblivion is the best one. Um, saying that though, the soundtrack from Skyrim, if you include all the DLC, contains. Stuff from all of the other soundtracks, which is great. So you can hear all of the, the classic themes. And what Jeremy Soule does as well is there's a couple of, of light motifs that he uses, light motives, um, which is just little melodic ideas. And he uses them in a bunch of different ways on each track so that you hear the same, you're hearing the same little da 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 da. You know, you're hearing the same little melodies over and over again in Oblivion. It's just great. People can say what they want about the Star Wars prequels, but they had great soundtracks, especially Episode 3. I'd say Episode 3 had, like, to me, one of the top five soundtracks ever. It's great. Um, John Williams does a supreme job with it. If not Disney, are there any film companies you would consider evil? I don't think so. I mean, there's converged. It's hard to say a corporation is evil because corporations are not people. Now, they can maybe do evil things or put out evil messages, but a corporation's not a person. So it's hard for me to say it's evil. I know that that's kind of a weird technical answer, but it's really like converged or not converged. The anniversary DVD has both cuts. All right, I'll check it out. In fact, um, maybe I'll look it up on Amazon right now. Let's get out of this pack Evan read. Now, now Amazon's going to think that like I'm super into like reverse harem werewolf fantasy. Um, legend. Tom Cruise. Here we are. Here's the Blu-ray. Here we go. That's the wrong region. I think the Blu-ray is uh, director's cut. Oh yeah, this is this is it. All right, cool. So uh, twenty-one bucks. That's expensive. I think I could have gotten it for like eight dollars at some point. Anyway, I'll I'll try to see if I can stream it somewhere for free instead of doing that i see there's a willow blu-ray now but i think you can watch willow on disney plus i actually have disney plus i didn't buy it it came with my phone contract apparently my wife found out about this so oh here's a ten dollar one yeah so uh, it came with my my phone contract and uh so i have it so anyway let's keep looking I actually have the uh, the I have a Korean DVD of Willow because you couldn't get it in the U.S. forever. Willow is a great movie too. A necromancer traveling across modern day America, trying to outrun his past to be urban fantasy. Totally. Um, Talisman by Stephen King and Peter Straub is urban fantasy. Uh, why active versus passive is important. Any character can be caught in a situation where he or she can be the only, only passive until he decides to do something. Never liked Han. He didn't fit in Star Wars 4 for me. Okay, yeah. I mean, he... I think I know what you're talking about. That video I made the other the other day. Yeah, you want... I mean, if you want a more masculine character, you want him to be active. Meaning he's being proactive and he's taking action. And he's fixing things. You don't want him to just be reacting the whole time. Um, do you think that the shadow novels rise above schlock? I'm not sure what those are. Oh, yes, the shadow. I just call them classic pulp, man. I wouldn't call them schlock. Schlock is, uh, to me, is like corporate product. Not not like pulp. Not old pulp stuff. 
Even pulp is an insult, but it just means like a classic rock'em sock'em story. What about urban fantasy where some elements qualify as magical realism, but others are hidden by deeper veils? I like that idea. I mean, I would probably, you'd probably still sell it as, you could probably put it in both categories on Amazon. You don't need to worry about fitting tightly into one genre ever. You fit, as long as you can kind of fit into one genre, you'll be able to sell it. People who are really writing tight to market worry about that kind of stuff, but I don't do that. And for your first books, you're probably not going to want to try to write tight to market anyway, uh, because it's it's a creative process. You need to get your you need to get your game down before you start trying to throw in every trope in urban fantasy to write for urban fantasy fans. Have you seen the Alex Jones breakdown of the Star Wars prequels? No. Uh, it's about three minutes long. Okay. As for passive turn to active, Padme is a great example from the prequel trilogy in episode one. Yeah. Um, Yeah, she, she went from running to actively fixing things. The Indiana Jones soundtrack is good. I agree. Crazy. Chameleon. Um, you can tell the difference between John Williams and Star Wars scores when George Lucas was making Star Wars and when the franchise... Yes, you can. Because the direction doesn't make room for it. Do you think it's possible to have long length but with fast pacing? Yes. If you have a really... A lot of plot, it can it can feel fast. So... Muramasa Blood Drinker has a lot of plot and it can feel pretty fast. There's a lot of reflective moments too. You don't want to have no reflective moments because that's where a lot of characterization happens. But, you know, it's a pretty thick book. There's a lot of plot in it and I really kind of cut it down to about 120,000 words to make it good. But there's a ton of plot. There's five acts worth of plot. Thoughts on series that never end. Thank you for the 299. Uh, Bogzar Kroll Levowski. Thoughts on series that never end. I don't. I dislike that. Uh, I think your series should have a conclusion. And when it ends, if you want to do a new series, even a new series that's kind of set in the same world, have it as a new series. Don't continue it. If the series continues forever, um, I just hate it artistically. And readers often don't like it either. They're like, where is this going? Is this going somewhere? But I don't know. You know, people like that, you know, Jan and Ivanovich kind of stuff. So it, it just depends. It's not for me. I like stuff that has a definite end. I like things with arcs that end. Um, I like things that have an ending so I can go on to other things. That's me. Why did critics give Willow poor reviews? Critics are generally not good at criticizing movies. Um, Willow's a great movie for what it is. I haven't, I haven't read critic reviews, so I don't really know why they don't like it. Uh, so I don't know, but critics often dislike movies because they don't think they're highbrow enough. They're pulp. Yet at the same time, they'll also give like, you know, a, a minus to like really bad Marvel movies in some cases. <laughs> you looked at the wrong legend Blu-ray. The right one is the ultimate edition, which has both the director's cut and the U S theatrical cut. Amazon sells it for nine ninety nine new. And four ninety five. Okay, I think I'm looking at it now. It's nine ninety nine new. Yeah, I think I'm looking at it right now, man. So maybe I'll get that, and we'll take a look at that. I see a devil and a unicorn, so it's got to be. It sounds looks like the most power metal movie I've seen. Um, what would be a cool story centered around a protagonist who is half Korean and half Japanese? That's a weird place to start. Um. I guess a story that takes place in World War II would be pretty interesting to me. Like, because you have uh, an imperial force in Korea, but, you know, you're ethnically connected to that imperial force, and yet you have your people in Korea. I could see that being very interesting. Or um, during one of the other attempts to invade uh, Korea that Japan did, like during the, say, the Sengoku period, that could be interesting. Did you follow up on that story with Nintendo telling Amazon to stop allowing selling of used physical Nintendo games? I did not. Um, I didn't. Sorry. I probably forgot about it. And I apologize. I got a lot going on right now. I'm trying to put some books out. Um, Froglick, thanks. Great advice here. Thank you. Yeah, this will this will be my first. I wrote a few before, but this is the first bit to publish. Yeah, that's kind of me. I wrote a couple books and then finally published one. Um by the way, City of Silver is one of my early books, one of my first books that I ever wrote. Heavily edited, of course, heavily revised in order to make it good. 
Uh, this was the original story that I, I wrote it for my wife um, when we were living in different cities. You can get it on Amazon right now for 99 cents still, and it's going to be the first of uh, the series, so I'll link that. Um, but by the time I got around to wanting to publish it, I realized, man, I did a lot of things that I just needed to fix. So I did a lot of fixing of this story and uh, I think it came out pretty good at the end here. Now, of course, once I finished this little plot that I was writing for my wife, she's like, well, where did that, what happens to the characters now? I'm like, well, you know, I, I was really just focused on like writing something that would have them escaping. I'm like, okay. So I wrote like a whole epic. I wrote 300,000 more words. So there's gonna be a lot more volumes of this. And now as, as, those, as I wrote those, I got better at what I was doing. So obviously, as you get better, you're able to look back and see how much, how far you've come and how much work you still have to do. Um, so there's going to be more editing I have to do for volume two. Uh, there's going to be more editing I have to do for volume three, but then there's less and less each time until I'm finally in my more modern style and I'm actually executing things the way I want to execute them. <laughs> have you played Dead Space? A long time ago. Yeah, when it came out. Um, have you played Dead Space? I have a long time ago. I remember liking it. Of course, they like canceled the entire studio that did it because they weren't selling enough DLC or something. Their their games are are unified games rather than a bunch of a bunch of DLC. So, oh, here's the City of Song Amazon page. You can get the paperback for six twenty five. I know that's a lot more than the ebook, but you do get the ebook for free by the way. And I'm trying to get up to 10, 10 ratings. So if you liked it, please do leave, um, leave a couple stars. It helps me out a lot. Do you think critics sometimes just have an agenda they're trying to push? Yes. And also I think they cozy up to Disney. As if they don't review the, if they don't re review the movie correctly, then they'll, um, they won't be allowed to review the next one. I think, uh, critics in the past had more freedom. Should Marvel films be praised helping increase, increase the theatrical length of films? Maybe that is something to praise. Good point, Ash. I think allowing films to be longer is a good thing. A lot of times, I think, feel like 90 minutes, it's just not enough space to tell anything besides like a romantic comedy. I also have Goldsmith's legend score on its own. It's essentially a classical tone poem reminiscent of Debussy's um, Daphnis et Chloe. I much prefer it to the Tangerine Dream score. Totally, I don't think I'm going to like a pop score. I've, I've seen this movie a long time ago, but I don't really remember the score. So it's going to be interesting to look at it again. There's no writing classes in my city. How do I know if my writing is improving? Good question. So first of all, you have to read it and compare it to things which you think are good and see if you're doing things that are good. You can give your stories to other people to read. And if they won't read them, it's probably because they're not very good. Um, that's something I've found, but you shouldn't expect your friends to like your writing because they don't write, unless they like the exact same books that you like, they're probably not going to like it. Your friends are not your audience. So it's hard. And the thing is about writing courses, a writing instructor often doesn't know what the hell he's doing. Hence, he's not writing books and he's teaching a class instead. <laughs> I'm not going to say always because there's tons of great writers. I've also met great writers who are terrible, terrible teachers. Um, so I've met guys who can write great and they just can't teach at all. They have no idea how to communicate the knowledge. They can't look at another person's manuscript and give any kind of feedback. They rely on their own editors for that, things like that. So, um, writing groups, I think are very hit or miss. I don't use them personally, and I don't use beta readers. I receive absolutely no feedback on my work prior to publication. Why, why do I, do I not seek out this feedback? Well, I know that they're good. Number one. Number two, I write the story that I intend to write. And so if somebody doesn't like it, that's okay. Doesn't doesn't make me want to change it. The only time I want to change what's there is if um, I feel like it's not doing what I want it to do. You know, or obviously I don't I want to fix typos, right? I don't if I if I it's really hard to ship without typos, you know. Vox Day shipped his latest book with typos. He ships every book with typos. But you know, his readers help him fix that. So a couple weeks in, the typos are gone. Um, it's really hard to publish independently without typos unless you have multiple proofreaders reading it. And big, big, big books ship with typos, by the way. But anyway, so yeah, I don't, I don't 
I don't seek out feedback and I don't try to gather feedback. I learned from my first books, including this one, when I gave them to friends, they wouldn't read them because it sucked, you know, so I had to improve. Um, and that was all the feedback I needed. I need to up my game because if people don't read it, it sucks, period. So writer, writers groups are, I think, because they're not your readers, they're not your audience, they're often not very useful. Uh, it's best if you can get the work out there somehow to people who are interested in the genre you're in and they'll tell you exactly what you need to know. Uh, I think you agree with Martin Scorsese calling Marvel films amusement park films. Absolutely. That's, I think, you know, people got all butthurt about that, but his thing is like, they're not high art. They're not communicating great deep things. They're for entertainment and there's nothing wrong with the entertainment to me. They're great for what they are. You know, they're great amusement park films. They're great stimulation. They're great entertainment. Sometimes they have some cool things to say, but it's not, you know, it's not the Godfather. It's not these bigger cinematic experiences that have a lasting impact on art or culture or the viewer. Most people are not going to remember the plot of Infinity War if they've only seen it one time, but they're going to remember stuff in The Godfather. Like, just there's a higher impact. From the from the a true auteur producing something that is a deep expression of his soul, Marvel products are corporate, and um, they're kind of the last piece of that mass market corporate um, pop culture. You know, the last piece of pop culture that's left over from the 20th century. So it's great. You can like them, and I like them too. You know, I don't dislike them for what they are. I like them for what they are, but I don't expect them to deliver the experience that I get from a Scorsese film. And I do like Scorsese films. What tabletop RPGs did you play and how did they influence your writing? They didn't influence my writing at all, I would say, but I played Dungeons and Dragons, multiple versions, original AD&D, uh, 3.5 or whatever we played a lot. Well, I think they had Forgotten Realms in it, and which was cool. Um, I'd say the only... The only maybe influence on my writing it had was if I DM'd like freestyle stories. Obviously, I'm writing as I do that. Or if I liked some of the settings, you know, I liked the Forgotten Realm settings, which most of the realms are not forgotten. But anyway, so I didn't do that. I played GURPS, which you can adapt to anything. Um, you know, the One Ring, which is now called like Adventures in Middle Earth, I think. Um, Shadowrun. I think I played a Star Wars one a couple of times. That they wouldn't, they didn't influence my writing because they're game systems. Okay, when people say I'm playing a story. That I'm like, that's read a book. I don't. I have no problem with stories and games, and I love great stories and games. And I think games can tell a story uniquely. However, you know, the idea that you play a game to access a story seems kind of backwards. You play the game because the game is fun, and there's a great story too. Your Star Wars videos uh, have a value beyond merely attracting viewers. Analysis of failure is an education uh, is as educational as that of quality and teaches viewers to recognize negative art trends as helpful. I think so. Thank you. I really appreciate that that sentiment. Um, just started Jedi Fallen Order so far. I actually love the game. Yeah, a lot of people are liking it. They're like EA made a good game. I'm like, what? EA allowed a good game to be released? They haven't released a good game in years. Yeah, that's how I feel about him. When Dragon Age 2 came out, and I'm like, this is cool. And then like two hours into it, I'm like, this is bad. <laughs> um, your Star Wars videos, thank you, thank you. Uh, Super Mario Galaxy 2 and Sonic Colors have great soundtracks. Oh, Sonic 3 has a great soundtrack. I like that soundtrack a lot. As well as, I like all the Castlevania soundtracks pretty much. Konami does used to do a great job with those. Uh, I need to wrap this up, guys. I'm over time. I know certain critics have held grudges regarding certain genres. Yeah, particularly horror. With the exception of specific films, critics dislike many horror films that are quite popular. Yeah, they're not horror fans. And this is a thing. Like, the critics are not necessarily the audience for that. Of course they don't like Saw. It's for horror fans. Freddy C. says he's reading Corporate Cancer. Good. It's a good book. I, I, I was very entertained by it and, and liked a lot of the ideas in it. And you don't have to like Vox Day to read something like SJW's Always Lie and get what he's saying. Okay, you don't have to agree with him. You don't even have to like him to see that he's very good at communicating that way and also is communicating the truth with that stuff. You have mentioned that classical and heavy metal are your favorite music genres. I wouldn't say classical. Classical is a constructed concept. I would say Baroque music. 
Is this coincidental or is there something that you perceive as a commonality between the two genres? Complexity, aggression, and um, working in modal spaces, which means that the tonality is not as sing-songy as it is with, say, classical period stuff. But I love romantic music. I love all that stuff. I like a lot of stuff besides that. That's also kind of why I like flamenco. It's more modal. Martin Scorsese's The Irishman is three hours long, so you might like that. I do like Scorsese films. Do you think the prequels, uh, as flawed as they are, will be more remembered than most Marvel films in 50 years? Yes. I think in 100 years it's possible the, the, um, the prequels will be more studied than the original trilogy because there's more weird cinema stuff going on than the original trilogy. I think they'll probably both be studied a lot, but it's possible that the prequels wouldn't up being more studied because of how unique the production was and how intensely awesome the aesthetics were. The prequels were the were the best aesthetically the best movies ever made. It's really hard to find a video uh, find a movie, I'm sorry, that has the same aesthetic depth and quality and impact as the prequels they're gorgeous the sound design is aesthetically beautiful too the music everything it's it's and they're great you know i think as far as how those look and feel they're amazing i think the original trilogy stories are probably better but i think the relationship to the medium will be more profound for the prequels the dark knight trilogy appears to be seen as art by many the fact that they're batman films doesn't matter as people can see artistic merit in them there is artistic merit in them and that's one of the things people are like this is the best movie ever made i'm like it's not that but you know dark knight might have been the best superhero movie ever made which basically means it kind of moved out of the realm of pure um superhero entertainment and really had a had like a cinematic impact it's kind of rare and that's cool i think it's actually a very good movie that middle one's very good i think the third one's underrated um the dark knight rises i think that one's a little underrated i almost forgot comic zone son oh comic zone's cool yeah i have that one too sonic one and two are also great yeah they're great soundtracks i think sonic three is the best one though there's some michael jackson stuff in it apparently that got left over from when he was ruined on ruin uh working on it before uh, a bunch of lawsuits came out and stuff so Anyway, guys, I'm looking at the time and it's 8.15. Please, if you would just consider it um, Eyes in the Wall is the new book. And um, I hope that you will consider pre-ordering it. And um, if that's what you want, if you like horror and you like monster tales and you like um, feelings of isolated children and madness, then then consider consider this. And if you're not on my mailing list, make sure you're on my mailing list at dbspress.com slash list uh, because you're going to get an advanced copy. Okay, so I'm going to put out a lot of advanced copies for this one. So make sure you're on it. You can get an advanced copy and read it before it even comes out. It will be available in paperback as well, but paperbacks I can't set up pre-orders for. It just it's not available. So the, the paperback will come out a few days before the ebook so that if you buy... The paperback, you can get the ebook. It'll come out. It'll basically come to your house the same day as the ebook if you are in, you know, a first world country and have Amazon Prime. So uh, hopefully that will be good for you guys. Please do consider it. I really, um, I really appreciate it. Uh, let me see if I can. I'll just answer the last two questions before I go. I think that Phase One is still the best Marvel phase. Iron Man, Captain America, Thor. Um, I think it's pretty good. Yeah, I don't like the first Thor movie. I'm probably the only person who liked the second Thor movie, I think. Uh, but the first Iron Man movie is great. Um, Captain America was okay, I think. But it definitely set things in place. Phase one was like the introduction. Phase two was the first experiment. Phase three was the second experiments where we're starting to see the formula break down. I think phase four is going to be... I think we're on phase four now. I think it's going to be bad. I'm just calling it now. The movies are going to... After seeing the preview for Thor, Love and Thunder, it's going to be bad. I don't think it's going to be good. I have a zero expectation of good movies. Um, maybe the maybe the Doctor Strange one will be good, but you, you don't know. Okay. Jared says Dark Knight Rises is underrated. I agree. 
Do you think the meta superheroes like Deadpool will become the next big fad? I do think that that's a possibility, Ash. Um, but it'll go quickly because it uh, kind of that meta level can be. It's a little bit of a of a self referential, and so once that's its own thing, that just means it's on the way out. Once you're referencing your own genre heavily, your whatever you're doing is on the way out um, because you have to be working on some base level. Um, thanks for everything. I appreciate it. I hope you guys will have a great, great day and uh, I'll see you guys next time.